All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Statistics with Julia from the ground up. My name is Yoni Nazarathi. I'm now in Brisbane, Australia. It has just turned uh, midnight here, so I'm in a new day already. And uh, thanks for joining. So let me share my screen and uh, we'll see what this is all about. So just a bit of housekeeping. Um, so during this, we, we're, we're going to be here for three hours, um, and we'll discuss quite a few things uh, dealing with uh, Julia, starting with um, first principles, assuming that you haven't used Julia at all, and then moving up through uh, quite a few statistical applications, showing packages, and uh, hopefully, if we have time, ending with a bit of machine learning as well towards the end. Um, now, in terms of uh, questions, so let me try and put this banner up. Let's see. So you can go to uh, Pigeonhole um, and ask questions. Uh, so go to this address, pigeonhole.at uh, slash stats, ask questions. If you're not registered for JulioCon 2021, uh, please, please do so now. So you simply uh, register to the workshop, it's free, and then you can ask questions. Um, I won't be able to answer all of the questions. I'll try to more uh, focus on content and moving the content forward. Um, but if you ask questions, peers can also uh, comment on your questions and try to answer some of them via the chat. And we'll also have breaks uh, where I'll try to answer top ranked questions. So that is that. Uh, now, if you've never used Julia before, um, you can go to this uh, installation video, um, so you can reach it also through um, just down here. So if you haven't installed Julia, then go to this video. It's one of many installation videos, but I made it with this uh, workshop in mind. So go ahead and go there. So you'll install Julia, then you'll install iJulia, and uh, that would pretty much put you with the Jupyter environment with, with which will work. And um, you probably, if you haven't done it yet, then I suggest first watching this and then installing. But if you're watching it all offline and you want to actually uh, go along and try things, then go ahead and, and, and install now. So that's that. Um, now, finally, there's a code repository for this workshop. So that's at this uh, link that you see below. All right. And um, it is here. So you go to Julia to my GitHub, uh, Yoni Nazarathi, JuliaCon 2021, Statistics with Julia from the ground up. And you can either uh, download the zip, or if you're a GitHub uh, user, then clone the repository. OK, and this would give you the files. Basically, we're using uh, one main file and a few data files. OK, so you'll see that. And that's, uh, that's this repository. Now, the instructions for uh, what to do for uh, running it uh, is um, the installation. Basically, you uh, install iJulia. You do it like that. And then uh, you run iJulia and Jupyter. We'll, we'll see that in a few minutes, not the installation by the running. Um, we're also using R call. So if you don't have R installed on your computer, if you're not an R user, don't worry about it. It's commented out. If so, then you can uh, get it to run. All right, so um, what I'm going to do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run Julia myself uh, to build this running version, which I have here. And um, I'll do it by uh, Julia's install my machine. This is a Mac. I'm spawning uh, now just a Julia REPL. This is called the Julia REPL, the read evaluate print loop. And here I can do some Julia commands, one plus one, and I've run uh, a little program that added one and one. Great. So um, the first thing I want to do is, is using iJulia. Um, and that uh, says that the package iJulia is in the system. And then I can run notebook. And that would spawn a Jupyter environment. OK, now you could have run it specifying which directory you want to be in, but uh, we're not going to worry about that. And in my case, the files for the repository, the files from here are in a folder uh, called git, mine, and juliacon2021, et cetera, et cetera. 
So uh, Jupiter, for those of you that haven't used Jupiter, uh, it's, uh, it's, an, it's an environment, a web environment, where you can actually uh, see the files that you're working with, like so. But more importantly, you open this thing called the Jupyter Notebook, and the Jupyter Notebook uh, encompasses both code and output, data analysis, and descriptions. So there we go. This is our, our Jupyter Notebook. Um, and I called it workshop during because I actually deleted a few things, uh, which and I, I will I will key them in and we will run them in parallel. Okay, so that's it. So I'll just change the banner which we have on. So not going to so you'll see just the the questions, but I I won't be answering questions about installation uh, per se. If you're uh, able to get it going, it's great. If not, then uh, doing it offline uh, is probably the the good thing to do. Hey, Yanni, hey. really quick, just wanted to suggest if you can remember to zoom in as much as possible on some of these things, just because through all the layers of different monitors and windows, the, the text size and things get pretty small. So yeah, this is perfect. Thank you. OK, thanks a lot, Logan. All right. All right, so um, back to the code repo. Um, so it, it, the, now, let me also say that if you go to the code repo, you can also click this link. Um, say you just want to look at the code and, uh, and not running if, if this is the way you're doing it live. And this will open the notebook in uh, NB Viewer, notebook viewer. So that's just a formatted non-runnable version of the code, of the, of the whole notebook. Okay, so that's the that's NB Viewer, and that's available here. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I think let's let's get to it. Um, so I'll go back to the Jupyter, Jupyter Notebook, and uh, here we are. Now, let me say that many of the code examples are actually adapted from uh, my co-authored book, Statistics with Julia, Fundamentals for Data Science, yada, yada, yada. And um, yeah, you can uh, go to the website, uh, this one, statisticswithjulia.org. The most useful thing you'll find on the website uh, except for uh, the link to the source code in the book draft, is actually this image gallery, perhaps. Um, and these are all code examples that you have in there. And if, say, you want to you wanna look at, at, uh, at, at, at something and you want to see, hey, how is this thing created? So you'll just click it, and it'll uh, push you over to the uh, code snippet that creates uh, this little image. Of course, there's a story behind the image, but that's, uh, that's what the thing is about. Right. Um, so that's that. Um, now, many of you or some of you would have seen the uh, data frames tutorial um, that ran yesterday, but it's it's uh, online in YouTube. So that's a great tutorial by Bogum Kaminsky. He's also the creator of the data frames package. So we'll only touch a, a bit about data frames um, in this tutorial because uh, we had that tutorial yesterday. And there's also a tutorial later in the week introduction to uh, Bayesian data analysis. My Kusti Skyte. All right, and of course, other uh, very exciting talks in this JuliaCon. Um, so great to be here, and thanks for joining. All right, table of contents. So we have quite a big plan today. Um, Ten items. Uh, we'll start with speaking about Julia in general, uh, and then we'll spend quite a bit of time step by step dealing with mean. I mean, if you want to do statistics, you got to be able to do the mean, right? We'll then go to some random number generation, some rand and do a small uh, pass through uh, R call. So that's interface with R. Uh, that's for the uh, statisticians here that use R. We'll do a bit of plotting. We'll speak about distributions. We'll do a few things with data frames, although again, there was other tutorial, a whole three hours on data frames, so you can follow. And then a few examples of basic statistical inference and do a bit of linear models, finish with machine learning. The works, that's it. Okay, let me just remove this banner. Okay, there we go. All right, so the tutorial was developed under Julia 1.60. Uh, so when you download this repo, you also get a project.toml uh, and manifest.toml files, and they specify which packages um, are exactly used, okay, and which versions of the packages. They don't specify the Julia version. And it also uses the following data files. So if I just do a read dir on current directory data, these, these eight data files, which are just simple comma-separated files, are also available here. 
Okay, they're all taken from the uh, statistics with Julio book um, source or, or repo. Okay, when I did this, of course, uh, my current working directory was where I am. So this is a Julia function, PWD, print working directory. It's not the shell command PWD. Now, what in, in general, in Jupyter, even before, before we start, so what did I do? So let me now hit the escape key. So escape, I'm going to hit X, and that deletes that cell. Uh, for those of you that somehow use VI but have never used Jupyter, that would be kind of familiar. And you can do a Jupyter a whole bunch of things. Um, more importantly is, for example, uh, create, uh, insert a cell above. You see insert cell above. But for this, I hit the A key. So in Jupyter, you can be in uh, command mode or edit mode. And let's call it so when I hit the escape key, I'm now in, in, in command mode. And I can hit A, and that creates a cell above. And I hit A, and it hit another cell above, etc. cetera. Um, you've got a whole bunch of keyboard shortcuts here. OK. So uh, we can delete cells, etc. Now, to run a cell, I actually do shift enter, and that would run the cell. Okay, so that's Jupyter, uh, but many of you have probably used Jupyter before. And if not, then the, the web has a variety of, of here's a, a quick reference sheet for Jupyter, which you can click and have a variety of other Jupyter resources. Oh, one last thing about Jupyter. So cell can be of the code type or the markdown type. So this is now a markdown cell. It's not runnable. I'll put it back in code and it's runnable. Okay. So Julia runs in the background and, uh, well, the Julia kernel running accepts this code and runs it. And that's all through the iJulia package. Now, the way we created this workshop, uh, we've actually, from the start, so, so you have some code here. I can run it, but it won't do much on my machine. But if you're running this for the first time, this will take quite a lot of time. Uh, so what, what I'm doing here is I'm... Uh, I'm asking Julia to use, in line number one, um, using the system package called PKG. And then I can do a few things associated with the package. Specifically, I'm telling Julia, please set the package environment to be in the current directory. OK? And package instantiate just uh, sets up all the packages. Uh, so if I run this uh, next cell, then I see these are the packages which I have installed. And again, for those of you that are downloading, that, that have downloaded this code and are running this uh, for the first time, if you did it an hour ago, then you'll probably be in good shape now. But if not, then this cell would take quite a lot of time. Uh, you could also do this via the REPL. So often working with packages is easy, easier via the REPL. And I'll show you that in a minute. OK. Now, here we have the. Um, a whole bunch of uh, using uh, statements for all of the packages that we're going to use. Um, sometimes you would just call the or invoke using of the package that you're going to use just above, just before the time you're going to use it. But here we just did it from the start. OK. Um, so think about these packages. So uh, random statistics, linear algebra, and dates are all come with Julia base. So these are all packages that once you install Julia, they're already installed. But the functions, structures, and in certain cases, variables that are exposed by these packages are not available to you. They're not in the namespace unless you ran using them. This cell here, this whole cell here, uh, is different than these cells. These you only need to run once. Uh, and this one you need to run every time you're re running this notebook, every time you're creating a new Jupyter, uh, uh, well, a new Julia kernel by, by resetting the kernel. OK, uh, we've got this. And the rest of the packages are actually all, uh, in a sense, let's call them community contributed. Well, that's kind of funny, because all of Julia is, in a sense, community contributed. But these are uh, not part of the base of Julia installation, although they are very common. So distributions and stats base uh, are for core statistics. Stats base basically has functionality that's not available in statistics. You've got CSV and data frames there for basic data, CSV, comma, separated files, and data frames are data frames. Uh, here's some plotting and output functionality. The Julia ecosystem has about five or 6,000 packages, maybe even more by now. Okay, uh, I think a bit even more than what I'm saying, but um, these, are, these are just a few key ones that we're seeing. 
Um, these packages deal with uh, statistical inference, machine learning, and we'll use all of these packages in one way or another. Um, Flux is Julia's uh, deep learning library. Uh, there are others as well, but Flux is, is pretty much up there. And Metalhead is a wrapper for Flux that we use. And this is a bit of mathematical miscellaneous stuff, combinatorics, uh, special functions, and roots for root finding. So discrete mathematics, general mathematics and numerical mathematics for finding roots. And finally, these last two packages um, create, um, well, give, give us some example data sets. All right. So now in my system, I have R installed. Um, so I'll also, uh, and I've installed in the package R call install, also do R call, and that allows Julia to uh, interface with R. Okay. It's different from the Julia call package in the R ecosystem that so allows R to interface with Julia. All right. Now, for those of you, again, running this for the first time, you might be running this cell, and it might take a whole lot of time. Um, and by the way, if, if you get some sort of error or problem that has to do with some package conflict, et cetera, uh, you can very well comment out most of these statements and uh, then expose them as you use the packages step by step. Okay. Now, finally, just before we start with this housekeeping, uh, I just created some function here. So uh, this is one way to create a Julia function. This is a one-line function, and I call this function fix seed exclamation mark. Exclamation mark is not a special Julia symbol. It's part of the function name. Okay. And what this function does, it just calls the uh, function seed exclamation mark from the random package. Okay, and resets the seed at zero. And this is just something that uh, we'll be running this function uh, again and again before uh, every time we generate random numbers, just so our examples are reproducible. Okay, so maybe at this point I will put up the question banner. Um, there are probably some questions there already. And let's allocate about three or four minutes to looking at the questions. So I'll go and and see if there's some top rank questions. Um, so I'm looking here. Um, okay, there's a question about Pluto. We'll speak about that soon. How do I do stats in Julia? That's a great question. Uh, are there packages for mixed modeling, da, 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 additive modeling? Um, yeah, there are packages for mixed effect, but I cannot name them per se. Okay, so I see that these are still very general questions. I'll leave the question banner on for a bit and just revisit the question uh, questions in a, in a minute or two. Um, but before we continue here with this uh, first part of the of the why Julia, uh, let's actually you're already here following Julia, so let's actually just run Julia on in this terminal. Okay, so now I'm I'm just going to run Julia by. Uh, but Julia is in my search path, so here I have a different instance of Julia. This one here is related on the right, is related to Jupiter that's running, but the terminal on the left is just a Julia REPL. I just want you to see the Julia REPL for a minute. So in the Julia REPL, I can also define functions. I can do loops. I can do anything. Uh, of course, it's easier to use a REPL with an editor, but you could do the REPL. You could use a REPL for uh, quick things. For example, you can. Uh, here is a matrix. Uh, one, two, three, four, okay. and then I can use the linear algebra. I didn't type so fast, I hit tab and there's an autocomplete, okay, using linear algebra, and let's find the inverse of this matrix. Here's a REPL. So for those of you that came from MATLAB, this might look very much like MATLAB, okay? So that's a REPL. Uh, now, in the REPL, if you want to enter the package manager, then you hit the right square bracket. So right square bracket. I just went here instead of writing commands, I'm going to hit the right square bracket. And this puts me in the package manager. So you see the prompt has changed. If I hit backspace, I go back to the REPL. Right square bracket puts me in the package manager. In the package manager, I can also uh, use commands such as status, for example, which will tell me which packages are installed. Okay. Now, when we work with packages, we work with different environments. And this workshop has a specific environment for it, just with the packages of the environment. Well, what we see here is a default environment, which is at v1.6. So if I want to change, let's just see a second that I'm in the correct directory. So before that, I'll just, I'm, I'm going to change to the environment of this current 
um, workshop. But before that, I'll just a second hit backspace and hit, I can do this, I can do PWD and that you've already seen the PWD function, but instead I'll actually hit semicolon and that puts me in a shell, okay? So I'll do PWD without uh, open round bracket, close round bracket, enter. And I just see that I'm where I wanna be. That is in JuliaCon 2021 statistic roundup, okay? So, you know, and here I can also see the files, etc. Let's hit backspace and get out of the shell. Okay, so you've got semicolon for entering shell, semicolon for entering shell, right core bracket for entering package manager. And now what I'll do is I'll use activate dot. Okay, I could put dot like this. So dot is a current working directory. And that now, as you see, the prompt change. So the activated package is, sorry, the activated environment is the environment of the current working directory. And if I do now status, then I only have the packages exposed for the current working directory. So this concept of environment, you can then allow, say, if, if you're do, doing some sorts of analysis that, that relied on lasso 0.4, but then you want to do a different, uh, different analysis of different data that uses lasso 0.6, and there were some breaking changes, say, in package lasso. This is just a hypothetical example. Then um, what you can do is you can create different environments and work in this way. Okay. So that's that. Let's leave this REPL and tell it bye-bye. And that's pretty much all we're going to see in the REPL. Now I'll go, go back to the questions and see if there's some uh, interesting questions. Um, I think we're OK for now. So please don't be offended if I ignore your question uh, just yet. It's just for the purpose of moving uh, forward. Uh, if when questions are upvoted, we'll also uh, in the next time we revisit questions, then we'll uh, we'll give them a bit more time. <coughs> okay, so why Julia? I mean, you're here, you're following Julia, you've heard about Julia, you might be a Julia user anyway. So why Julia? Um, if you go to uh, if you go to Julia language and. Um, you get pretty much here all of the all of these descriptions and they're all correct. So fast, dynamic, reproducible, composable, general, and open source. And all these things kind of come together uh, and in my view are described in this plot, which kind of shows you the potential Pareto optimal frontier that existed prior to Julia, where you've had some you've had some software, uh, well, some languages like Python and Mathematica, et cetera, that are very good in terms of development speed. So you can actually develop quickly. And that means they had good ecosystems, they're easy to use, you don't have to wait much for compilation, et cetera, et cetera. And you've got all these other languages that are uh, good for run speed. But um, pretty much everybody knows that everything that you developed in uh, Python or MATLAB or Mathematica actually use C or Fortran under the hood, okay? So you might have had your code run above it, there was things under the hood. And if you actually wanted to make things run fast, you had to go to this cloud on the right. And these two clouds, well, that's what maybe is called the two language problem. And you people actually, you know, an algorithm developer would work here and then transfer uh, her code to a, uh, you know, an embedded software developer that would work here. So Julia aims to give you the best of both worlds. It's very fast in terms of run speed, effectively at C speed, um, and, and some benchmarks faster, depending on what you do. And it's as easy to develop as Python, MATLAB, or Mathematica. Of course, the language is newer. There's still few, uh, less users, et cetera. Uh, there's also more uh, latency, so the first time to plot problem. So uh, because the language is feels interpreted but is compiled, uh, some things are not as responsive. Um, but these problems are being solved uh, every few months and every uh, year and getting better and better. And uh, Julia is good, in my view, as a statistical analysis language. So some ways to run Julia. We've basically seen the REPL and Jupyter. Uh, just know there, there are many other ways. I did see a question in the chat about Pluto. So Pluto is a very exciting um, platform that gives you dynamic notebooks. Um, so if you go to the MIT course, for example, on computational thinking, which uh, you might see, then you'll see that they use Pluto notebooks and it's great. Now there is uh, an IDE. If you're working with R, you might be using R Studio. IDE is integrated development environment. Uh, the, 
the most popular IDE for Julia is this thing, uh, Visual Studio Code. Okay, so Visual Studio Code is a is a is an editor in general, uh, and there is Julia for Visual Studio Code, and you've got your code here, you've got your output, you've got uh, you can inspect data, etc. Uh, so in many ways, that's a way to go. Although people sometimes use the REPL together with their favorite editor, working files in different ways, etc. But Visual Studio Code is certainly gaining a lot of momentum. Be aware that if you look at uh, slightly older resources on the web, you'll see quite a lot of things with Atom, which is still very useful and good. Uh, Atom is another editor that had the Julia IDE inside of Juno, uh, but um, the front runner now is Visual Studio Code. And if I'm not mistaken, then the efforts of Juno and Visual Studio Code for Julia um, are joint. The company Julia Computing also provides Julia Hub, uh, which allows you um, to uh, run Julia uh, in the cloud. And I hear that's a great service. Uh, I used to use our service Julia Box for uh, teaching mass service courses and statistics uh, back a few years ago. Um, now, you can, uh, there are even some people that use Julia embedded inside our markdown with Julia Call. Okay, and there are more methods. So these are ways of, of, of running Julia. Just a few key resources. Of course, you've got the main Julia page. You've got the Julia documentation, which is just superb. Uh, it's just excellent doc documentation. It's long, but it actually gets you there, uh, and uh, I really find it useful. So just go to the Julia documentation. Um, this resource, the Julia Express, so I think here it is, uh, this is actually by the speaker of, uh, of yesterday, Bogomil Kaminsky, uh, dataframes.jl. I find this document to be kind of a quick and minimal short introduction to the essentials of what the language gives you. Uh, so I really like this resource. I recommend it. Um, there is a nice book, Think Julia, which is an introductory book. Um, and then there is this course in MIT that I was telling you about. Uh, we, too, at the University of Queensland, you can click this course. Uh, so uh, we're starting a course here where we're teaching mathematics students basic programming, well, basic and quite advanced programming, all based on Julia. So go ahead and visit that link at your time. And you've got the statistics with Julia resources. Uh, that's my book that I showed you previously. Now, pretty much for every package that we're going to use, um, you have... Uh, pretty good documentation. I mean, sometimes it's still evolving, but it's often quite, quite good, uh, certainly if the package is popular. And uh, package names end with a .jl file. Uh, sorry, .jl uh, end. Now, the Julia files, you would typically call Julia files that are Julia source code files. So let's go back to uh, Visual Studio Code. This is my hello world .jl. It's a Julia source file. In contrast to say the um, the Jupyter notebook files, which are .ipymb, the P here stands for Python, even though this Jupyter notebook also runs Julia. Okay, the package names are also called .jl, even though you won't find any real entity plots .jl. You'll use package plots and you'll add package plots, but plots .jl is just very searchable. So if I go plots .jl for example, and that puts me typically in GitHub. So if you're a GitHub user, you're used to that, but if not, then what you see is typically all this code, and, but you want to go below and then find the documentation. Okay, so you hit doc stable, and uh, this is all the documentation for plotting in Julia, and it's pretty good. All right, so you can do that for most packages. Uh, in terms of chat, there's Julia Discourse. Um, well, not chat, but a forum where you can ask questions, uh, often quite specific, and get answers. And there's a less formal place, which is a Slack organization for uh, Julia. And I, I just find it incredible. I and mean, Slack is often, we use Slack for small groups, but the whole Julia community, or a good part of, is on Julia Slack with dozens or even hundreds of different channels on different subdomains, and you can find your friends in your specific area. For example, join Julia Slack for Slack statistics and, uh, and say hi to everybody there and get some answers uh, for the things you want and help others as well. Okay, and of course, there are local Julia clubs. For example, here in Brisbane, Australia, we have the Julia Language Meetup. Uh, and look around your area around Earth, and you'll probably find a club too. And if not, you might form one. Now, YouTube is a great resource. This video, you might be watching this now on YouTube and not live. 
Um, keep in mind that in terms of Julia, we are now in, if I'm not mistaken, we are in July 2021. And you want to go back for concrete help to videos from the past year and a half or two, or two and a half. So you don't want to go below Julia 1.0. I mean, you learn some things there, uh, but the language has evolved. So just keep in mind that some videos of YouTube and YouTube are, are, are a bit old and they tell you a whole lot about how the language evolved, but they're less informative about what to do per se. Uh, the computational thinking courses of MIT are great on YouTube, and many other resources as well. Okay, so that was our, uh, our section one of 10. Let's go back here to the table of contents. We finished with why Julia, and let me put up the question time banner again and see if there's anything to deal with. Okay, so th there is a general question, and the question is, um, what's the motivation of creating new packages that contain more stats functions instead of adding to existing package like statistics? Um, so we got to keep in mind that there are uh, hundreds, if not thousands of, of statistical methods. And if you see what happened in the R ecosystem, you, you actually have thousands and tens of thousands of packages. Not all of them are very popular, but you just need packages for different methods. Uh, it's hard to grab all of the functionality in one specific uh, package. There are multiple reasons for that. One is size and code bloat. Another is, is, is dealing with namespaces or just documenting the things. So statistics is a big world, and that's why you'll find uh, dozens, if not hundreds, of statistical packages in Julia. We'll only see a few today. Let's see. Uh, Pluto question, we discussed Pluto. I think that's, okay. So there's a question about Julia compilation and we'll get to that, uh, to a level. Um, and there is a question of why is Julia better than R? What benefits does Julia have over R? So I don't think it's a matter of better or worse, uh, but it's a, it's a matter of, of where things are going. So today R is, quite a good um, platform and it gives you quite a good platform and ecosystem for doing uh, statistics. I wouldn't say for doing uh, machine learning because Python is still the language of the machine learning world. Okay, you go to R, you have data frames built in, you have linear models built in, and it's actually responsive. Okay, uh, however, once you wanna do something that's anything that's slightly non-standard in R, if you have any loop that you wish to execute in any way, uh, you'll be waiting for ages. Uh, and the matter of fact is that almost every uh, statistical analysis package in R is linked to some DLL, some dynamic link library that's written in C. So there's this barrier between what you use as a user and what the developers use. Now, all of the code, I believe effectively all of the code, if not all of the code that we're gonna run today is all written in Julia. So Julia gives you one language stack. And when you wanna see how something is implemented, you just you can even go to the source code of the package and understand it. It's a high level language that's, that's, that's readable and understandable. I'm not saying that C is not, I developed in C for a few years, but it's a, it's, it's a different place. And most, are, most data scientists would not wanna spend their day chasing pointers in C. Okay, um, so that's in a sense a key benefit that you get in Julia over R. Uh, one deficiency that still exists is that R is slightly more responsive, uh, but that's changing. Um, now, another thing is that just Julia was created uh, now almost a decade ago, the inception, but that's still in modern times, whereas R evolved from the S language and carries a whole bunch of baggage. And I hope that what you'll see today in terms of the way Julia handles distributions and the way it just uh, uses uh, multiple dispatch for just the function mean, you can do multiple things with that. It's a much more organized language than R. All right, I think let's move on from the questions and get back to it. All right, so what do you mean? So, if, you'll go, if, if you've downloaded the notebook, you'll find a whole bunch of cells here. And what I'm going to do, I'm just going to fill them out. And we're actually just going to explore uh, something. Uh, 
Okay, so um, I fix the seed, and then in line number two here, I uh, create a variable data, uh, which is the result of calling the rand function, where is the first argument I give the normal constructor. Uh, guess what? It gives you a standard normal distribution, and I create five of these. So uh, data, uh, I can do, for example, the length of data is length five. It's a vector of five elements. And the type of these elements is float 64. So one of the main things that Julia gives you, but often hides from you if you're a user like me, is types. So we created now five random values, which are typed to be float 64. Uh, if I would have done rand, um, say one, two, five, so that means choose five random elements from the uh, collection one comma two, then I'll get also a vector of five elements, but this vector is of in 64s. So inherently under the hood, Julia knows, oh, okay, this data, well, let's, let's call this data two, okay? So this data two is of the type vector of in 64s, while this data is of type float 64s. So we can actually query that. We can say type of data. Data is a vector of float 64, which happens to be an alias of the multidimensional array of float 64s, only that the dimension is one, okay? So in general, you could have had a tensor of float 64s, 64-bit floats, okay? Double precision floats, right? Whereas if we do type of uh, data two, of, then it's a vector of in 64s. Now, this might not impress you just yet, but if you're trying to figure out, hey, what can make a language faster? I mean, it's not that you're uh, putting quantum computing. That's, by the way, a parallel workshop right now. But it's not that you're putting quantum computing inside your CPU. It's the same CPU, what can make it faster? Well, one of the things is that every variable is represented by its type. But a nice feature for high-level users, as I think of myself, and, and you might think of yourself as well, is that you don't have to think about types too much unless you really want to. So most of the code examples that we'll see today, you know, we're aware of the type, but we're not uh, writing code in a very uh, type-aware fashion. I know that's kind of contradicting, but I hope you'll see what I mean when we continue. OK, so good. We've created an array of numbers. Um, this uh, section I remind you is called, what do you mean? So we're gonna spend quite a lot of time now computing the mean of these five numbers, computing the mean of these five elements. Well, the first thing we can do is we can just sum them and divide by their length. Um, okay. So what I got here is because I'm I'm I'm, um, I'm I'm using a whole bunch of packages together. There is a name clash with uh, uh, our data sets and ML data sets. Okay, and this has appeared now. I'm not sure what it, why it popped up now, but it's irrelevant for us directly right now. All right, so the mean, you can sum up the elements and, and divide by their length, okay? And of course, we could have said that n would be the length, and um, divide it by n. All right, we can also do something else. We can do something like this. Um, this is not pretty, and there's no reason really to do it, but by doing so, you actually see that plus, the plus operator, the same plus that we use for one plus one, is actually a function. And if I do question mark on any function name, in this case, the function name is just going to be the uh, character plus, then I get the help available for that function. So what have I done here? I've called plus on data. But that's not it. I've also used the uh, dot, 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 which is a splat operator, which actually took the elements of data. And uh, this, what I did above, was equivalent to doing plus of data one, the first element of data, data two, data three, data four, data five, divided by n. 
of times n that divided by. Okay. So dot 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 takes array arguments and converts them to be the input arguments of the function plus, and the function plus can take any variable number of arguments. Now, what you'd find surprising is that in Julia, things like plus are actually implemented in Julia. Nevertheless, Julia is in C speed, and that's part of its composability. Okay, so uh, you can actually go to the go to the code base and see how plus is implemented. Okay, uh, but let's let's do this uh, in a slightly different manner. Say we want to do this as a running mean. Okay, there's no reason to do it for uh, five elements, but say that this is what we want. So what do I mean by X bar sub I? I mean the sample mean or the average, the arithmetic mean of the first I elements. Okay, so you probably know this recursive formula, which you can get just by opening the summation and taking the Ith element. It gets a weight of one on I plus the um, previous mean of the previous observations. Okay, so that's a running mean. By the way, this here is a markdown cell. If I select it, I see the LaTeX code for this cell. Okay, and I can hit Shift Enter to format to render the cell again. Okay. So say I want to implement that. Well, let's create a function, uh, and we'll create. We'll call this function uh, my sum. Uh, sorry, I'm I'm still not where I want to be. Uh, but oh, okay. But let's let's move there. That's okay. So I wanted to create a function, but let's let's start with an initial mean. That's an initial value. This is how you do comments in, in Julia, initial value of zero. And then go for uh, i and one to length of data. And what we'll do is the mean is one divided by i times the i data point. Plus, uh, I minus one by I, all that times the previous mean. And, and the last cell that you have in a, in a, um, I'm sorry, the last, the last line you have in a cell is the mean, it is the output. Okay. So we've just implemented this formula. Okay. Now there's no real reason to do this, but what I wanted you to see is to see a loop. Uh, to see that Julia array indexing starts in one, uh, in contrast to Python, JavaScript, C, and other languages, uh, but like R and MATLAB, okay? And this is how you index arrays, and to see some arithmetic, okay? Now let's let's wrap this thing inside a function. So we'll create function and we'll call it my mean, and the argument is data, say. And uh, you can use uh, a bit of keyboard shortcuts in Jupyter to do formatting. And here I could have said return in, and that's a return value, but uh, let's just put MN, this MN here, and say last uh, line of a function is the return value. So that's, uh, that's a function that does this. And, you know, data, we could have called this. this. This data has nothing to do with the global variable data, which we have, but it's rather the input fu function to the, the input argument to the function. Let's call this input. Data. Input data. Okay. So the output of this cell is a generic function with one method, and it's called my name. Now, what is this thing, a function with one, one method? Well, we'll see that soon. We'll see that in a few minutes. Right. Let's just try and apply it first of all. Let's check it on this data, which we have. We get the same mean of 0 0.32. Okay, good. We're happy. Let's just also make another performance. Uh, well, it's more, not more a syntactical improvement as opposed to a performance one. Um, so those of you in Python might know that you can use the enumerate in loops. So what I'll do here is uh, is enumerate input data. Okay, so this would be the D so for every D in input data for every data point. But I still want to know uh, the index, so the index is going to be I. So this 
this is called the tuple. The tuple i comma b is going to give us this. Okay, so that is just a, it's just a syntactic improvement. So this is borrowed from Python, I believe. All right. Uh, so good, we have a function my mean, and we can even we can even create documents for it, uh, documentation for it. Uh, you know, my mean function, and I believe we can even copy, for example, formula and put it in the documentation. So I'll copy this formula and put it here. Works like this inside. Does and uh, oh that didn't work. Okay, I'll, I'll stop here because there is a few with the dollars. I should do escape sequences for these dollars. And um, escape sequence. So let me fix this later and um, scratch that. I didn't try this before. So when you put a, um, uh, I'm not sure at this. Point. So let's just. Remove this attempt of creating documentation. And if somebody has a comment later on how to how to do that, then let me know. Okay, so that's uh, that's this mining. All right, but let's see that we can do means of other things. Um, so, um, what if we had a um, um, still up here a um, Data, which is going to be now rand normal um, of n of the length five plus m of um, and m times rand normal and some m rand normal rand bracket. Okay. So what I'm doing here is m is the imaginary uh, the square root of negative one, and Julia created now an array of uh, of vector of uh, of of complex entries. Okay, so data now has complex entries. Um, can I do a mean of data? That's the system mean of data. Mm, yes. Can I do my mean of data? Yes. So the the function here did not care about the input type as long as it could do these operations for that input type. Um, but we'll see we'll see we'll see that that kind of uh, um, it, we sometimes want to extend that a bit. Now, when when we created the function my mean, when, you know, we created here again. Uh, it told us in the first time it said, "Hey, my mean has multiple methods." Now, what is that? Let's do methods of my mean, and the function my mean has a single method, and it just create accepts pretty much anything. That's an any. Okay, but if we do methods of mean. And we see that the function mean has 105 methods. So let's understand that a bit. So the concept of a method. Now, if you've done object-oriented programming, as many as you have, you'd think of methods as functions associated with a class, and you can apply, uh, you, know, you can, once you have an object, an instance of that class, you call different methods. The, Julia uses the phrase method differently. Uh, Julia is not object-oriented in the classical sense. Okay, it's composable, but it's not object-oriented. So a function is a basic entity, and for that function, you can actually have uh, different methods that differ based on their input arguments. So for example, now in my system, mean has 105 methods. Okay, I can do mean of many types of things, most of which in this case are actually uh, are, are either models or for multivariate uh, distributions or from multivariate statistics, et cetera. But I can also do just mean of elements. So I can do the mean of a normal random variable with, or let's do something else of an exponential random variable uh, with parameter 2.5. The mean will actually be 2.5. That's that's Julia um, distributions parameterize exponentials by their mean, not by the rate, not by the inverse of the mean. Okay, so I can I can call mean on different types of things. Right. And uh, this 
this feature of Julia is called multiple dispatch, and that's one of the things that makes Julia composable, and we'll see that a bit, a bit more uh, as we continue. Uh, now, if I do at which mean of data, this thing here is a macro, okay? So the language also has macros, which are higher order functions that are not uh, that are, well, they're, they're, they're pretty much in the pre-processing phase created, but they allow you to do different things. And in this macro, it's not something you'll often create yourself, uh, but you use them quite a lot. Um, and the macro tells you, um, that's the input to the macro mean data. It says, which mean data, did we, did, what, what did we actually call? So in this case, we used the mean function with input argument A of the type abstract array. So anything of the type array. And dims here is an optional argument. And it tells you where in the Julia source code you can find this function. Okay. So that's, uh, that's, that's on that. But... Um, Let's just create now a slightly more generic version of of, uh, of my mean, which will be better than uh, than the my mean that we created. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do function my mean, and I'll um, I'll call it um, I'll, I'll I'll give it an input argument data, but now I'm going to say what's the type of data. So the type of data is going to be, um, say, a float a vector of uh, float 64s. And the return type of this function is going to be a float 64. So again, I, I could have done, I did it before without specifying what is the type of the input argument, but now I'm actually coloring the type of the input argument. Okay. Um, so that this this is going to be mining that does that, and just for our purposes, I'll just copy the same code we had before. Uh, use it. Okay, so this should be data. In our case, that's what we called it. I think we have now this function mining. Look, so, so now my mean is a function with two methods. And if I do a methods of my mean, I've got two methods associated with Now, if I was going to do my mean on an array that has the numbers one, two, three, and notice a type of, say, one is an int 64, it's different than type of 1.0, which is a float 64. Okay, so my mean of one, two, three will work, and that's fine. But I can also have my mean of um, 1.0, 2.0, and I'll keep this a three, but that doesn't matter because in an array, in an, in an array like that, once I put one of the literals as a float, the type of this whole thing is going to be a float. Okay, so type of uh, this thing is a vector of floats anyway. Okay, and it also computed the mean. However, let's do which. I mean was called here. This was this my mean that works on general input data. And let's do which on the my mean that worked with the float 64. At this point, Julia knew that I am putting an in input argument that's of the type vector float 64. And it knew that my mean has a function, it has a method for the my well, has a method that works on vector float 64. So it was this function that was dispatched. So this, in a nutshell, is the multiple dispatch feature, which actually allows Julia to be very fast. Now, there was a question before about the compilation model. Uh, what Julia does is that it compiles every function you create, and it will compile different methods uh, for that function based on, on, well, for every method that you implement. And we'll, we'll do something just a bit more in a second, and you'll see that too. So basically, there are two different my mean implementations. In this case, it's silly to do because they do the same thing. They do the same type of logic. Uh, however, one is compiled in an optimized way for float 64s, and one is more general. Okay, and the more general can sometimes be potentially slower. Okay. Now, let's say we, we wanted to go just one step further. So let's go to now the mean of other types. Okay. So I'm going to fix the seed, and we're going to create this thing. 
Now let's just unpack what we have here in line two. Uh, so this is a list comprehension. So I can do stuff like um, say i for i in one two five, and that creates a list one two five. But I can also do, for example, i plus one squared if I'd like. Okay, so I reevaluate this expression uh, for i for anywhere in this collection, and that's, that's how you define a, you can construct an array of sorts. Now, what I'm doing here is I, I could have also um, done, let me just copy this and instead of, instead of i plus one squared, I'll just put three, for example. So the valuation of this three is completely independent of, of the value of i, so it's just a bit nicer not to name i, so I can put an under bar. Okay. Just so you see that. All right. And of course, instead of three, I could have also had a rand if we'd like, and that's fine. Anything that doesn't depend on i, this would work. But what we have here in line number two is we create a um, rand from a normal uh, with a two by two. So it's a two by two matrix. So if I would have done, for example, two by two by five, I would have had a tensor. So it's a two by two five, it's an array of uh, dimension three, which two by two by five, okay, or a tensor of dimension three. All right, then let's go back to the matrix. So that's a random matrix. So my data now is a five element vector of matrices each that has flow 64 entries. Okay, so these are formatted uh, like this now. Okay, but if I would have done, for example, let's look at the second element of data, uh, then here is this second matrix. This is this matrix that I'm highlighting above. All right, so can we do the mean of this data? So what would we mean by the mean? Well, what we mean is we mean to add the matrices, like one adds matrices, and then uh, which is element-wise addition, and then dividing by the total number of matrices. So can we do mean of that? Yes, this is a mean matrix. This is a mean matrix for these four matrices. Now, can we do my mean of that? So we now get an error. Now, when you're coming to a new language, obviously dealing with errors is one of the things you need to do because that's uh, just life. And even when you're not just coming to a new language, even if you're in the new language. Uh, so what is the core thing we see here? So we see method error, no method matching. There's no method matching the plus, okay? So plus, we already know plus is a method where we were trying to add a matrix of float 64 and a float 64, okay? And it actually sends us to where the error is. So this is a stack trace in the call stack. It's at main in 39 line seven. Now, if you were working with files and the files would have a name, you'd have the file name and where that's opening. So let's go to in 39 line seven, okay? In 39 is in 39 uh, that went to the, um, oh, did I delete in 39? That's not good. Okay, I think I've, Deleted in 39, but let's okay. Anyway, so that 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 error exists. Okay, so what I want to do now is to just create um, one. Um, I want to to create one more abstraction of the, what my mean function that would uh, overcome this error. Okay, and you've already seen how to. So I'll, I'll take the code that has here and I'll enhance it just a bit. Okay, so we'll take this. Here, and enhance it just a bit, and then we'll have a bit of question time. Okay, so um, my mean is going to take uh, data, and it's a vector of float 64s. But no, we didn't have a vector of float 64s. What we had now was a vector of matrices. So let's try to program in a more generic way. Now, this is not the thing you do when you're using Julia for like a, like a statistical user. Uh, but it's it's nice to see this from the start, so you kind of know what type of things are happening under the hood. Okay, so instead of a float sixty four, we had a matrix. La 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 la. 
a matrix. We won't, we won't put a matrix, we'll just put a generic type, okay, T, and our mean returns is generic type, and we'll say where T. Uh, this specifies T is anything. Now, you could have had where T, where T is a number, where T is a matrix, where T are certain things, there's a type system, but now let's, let's assume T is anything, okay? Now, when we take the mean of a anything, well, we don't want to in, in initialize the mean with, you know, we're running the recursive mean with a zero. We want the initial mean to be the zero of that anything. In that case, it should be in, in our use that we have here, it's gonna be the zero of the matrix. But what we can use is we can call the zero function on the first element of the data, for example. Or we could have had data begin, okay. So when you have, look, if I do zero on the matrix one, two, three, four, this is a matrix that has one, two, and then three, four on the rows below, I get this matrix of zeros. If I would have had one, two, four, three, four, eight, yeah, a two by three matrix, I get these zeros. So that's that's how you would do this, this slightly more uh, generic uh, program. Okay, and I think this should work. And at this point, after I do this, if I now do methods my mean, you already see that mean has three methods. But if I do methods of my mean. Then there's mean of vector of float 64. There's mean on anything, hoping that it works. And there's mean on a vector of t's. So when you call ju when you call my mean or something, the Julia dispatch system, it does dynamic dispatch, is going to check, is that something a vector of float 64s? If yes, it's going to call this function. If it's a vector of something where that something is something else, but it's already not a float 64, it's gonna call this method, okay? Not the function, this method. Otherwise, it will call this one, okay? Let's look again at our data. Our data is a five element array of things, and let's do my mean data and array. It's the same as the mean of data. Okay. So Julia was able to do that, and that's uh, in a nutshell, um, what makes it so fast. Now, just to see this just a bit more, and then we'll take questions after these three cells. Uh, so let's use these three macros. Uh, and this is not something that you would do as a user per se, but it's useful to, to know that this thing exists. So whenever I create a function, when I created a, a function, in this case, the method for the function, my mean, and this was my method, Julia compiles it. Okay, it doesn't interpret it. It's not like R or Python where the text stays there and then the Python or R interpreter goes step by step. Python has just-in-time compilation, but it doesn't have the same uh, information that the Julia compiler has. Okay, so Julia compiles it. Now, in this compilation process, one of the first steps is lowering the code. And the details are not important, but what's important is that that's this first step is in a sense a uh, syntactic step where Julia took the the valid Julia syntax and made it in a more uh, well in, in a more machiney syntax that still keeps uh, that that's still really Julia. So up to names of um, of variables and functions, th there's almost a one to one mapping between this code lowered and this function, almost. So that's just something to know. And everything that has to do with macros lives in this level. But that's fine. I mean, that's the same type of parsing also happens in R and Python when you do it. But the next thing that Julia does is it transfers this, well, it does some things in the, in the process, but it transfers this into LLVM. LLVM, low level virtual machine, is an assembly language without a physical processor, kind of like the Java virtual machine. So LLVM is used by the Go language, by C, C++ compiles to LLVM and other languages. And the good thing is that this language does not care if I'm running on one processor or another, okay? But it's an, uh, it's an efficient assembly language. I mean, this is of course not readable. It's a lot of things for this my mean, but the thing is that it's an LLVM. And at this point, Julia uses the state-of-the-art 
LLVM compiler to compile it. In my case, I'm running on a Mac with an Intel processor into native code. And this, if you've ever done assembly on Intel machines, then these, these will look uh, familiar, OK? So even though the language is high level and feels like a high level scripting language, I just want you to know that as you use Julia, all these things happen under the hood, and hence you get performant code pretty much by default. Of course, there are pitfalls, but we, this is not a workshop about performance. OK, let me turn on the question time. So we'll have some questions, and then we'll take a, a bit of a break, uh, just a two-minute break. And let's see. So I'm looking at the questions. Um, I'll go to latest. Um, so there's a question, why use Jupyter rather, rather than Pluto JL? Pluto JL is a different environment. Jupyter is still kind of a standard uh, data science environment where you can do a whole lot of things statically. And Pluto JL, things are, are dynamically uh, linked. Um, maybe in the future, everybody will use Pluto, but there's still some performance penalties. Um, what are the doc string conventions for Julia functions? Um, so in general, Julia functions are, are written in lowercase where you reserve uh, uh, uppercase for, uh, well, first letter uppercase for types, okay? So this is the, the normal type, okay. normal type, which is a normal distribution in this case, okay? It's an uppercase, whereas functions would be lowercase. And you typically use um, under braces. You don't do camel case. Um, are there linear algebra routines written in Julia? We'll get to some linear algebra towards the end of this workshop. Uh, Julia uses the uh, LAPAC and BLAS. And uh, in certain cases, higher level things are written in uh, in Julia and their, their, their performance. One of the good things is that the linear algebra library in Julia actually makes heavy use of the type and that type system and that improves performance. Um, other questions? Is it possible to save the state of the compiled package? Uh, this was, uh, was, this would prevent recompiling all the packages. Um, Yes, so that's typically packages are not recompiled every time you enter, okay? There's also something called package compiler when you want to pre-compile packages so they so their deployment is faster, and that's becoming more and more common, but that's for package developers. But in general, the package is not pre-compiled every time. It will be pre-compiled if dependencies change. Um, yeah, so there's... Um, a comment, maybe side issue, mean STD and median. And, uh, in, so there is a discussion, uh, just so you know, so that you'll see a comment by Alan Edelman, one of the co-creators of the language. Should mean STD and median be in base? Uh, yes or no? So in earlier versions of Julia, more functions from linear algebra and statistics were exposed immediately to the user, whereas um, in, in since about uh, version 1.0, and we're well beyond that, you have to do using statistics or using linear algebra. Um, okay, I think I'll stop here and keep keep posting your questions. And I hope I, you can also discuss with each other based on these questions. And what we'll do is uh, it's now 1.09 a.m. here in Brisbane, Australia. We'll take a three minute uh, break. So at 12 past the hour, uh, if you're in India or in other places, it's not exactly past the hour. But in three minutes, uh, we should see each other back. Now, I think I have a screen for that. Uh, let's see. So we're going to take a break now. Okay, see you in just under three minutes.
Okay. Such an abrupt stop for this uh, nice music of the break. I kind of like it. Um, let's see, banners. Turn off this banner and let's move on. All right. So we've had an array of arrays. Let's just do just a bit more. So, and our data is just an array of arrays. We can take the HCAT that's, uh, I think, borrowed from the world of MATLAB, so horizontal concatenation, and create a matrix of this thing. Um, sorry, the data is, um, let's just create this data again here. So I'll, I'll delete these cells for a sec. And, um, Create data again, and here is here is an array of arrays, and there we go. Um, so, um, oh, sorry, this is not the array. Of, this this data is not an array of arrays. This data is an array of matrices, but that's okay. Uh, so you see, the data is, is now an array of matrices, and that's why I've got, I'm, I'm getting a, a two by ten matrix. So I'm getting uh, five two by two matrices uh, concatenated. Um, we can plot this um, and heat map will plot it. And what you're seeing here, the fact that, that this is uh, slightly unresponsive, this computation, that's uh, this is a, this first time to plot, uh, but this is just something that's getting better and better from version to version. And the second time to plot is gonna be instantaneous. Uh, but what we're gonna plot is plot the this see this uh, two by 10 matrix, uh, a heat map of it. That's gonna appear in a second. And um, here it is, okay. So uh, that's that. And um, if we would do mean applied to uh, data like this, uh, well, that would be the mean of all entries. Um, if we would do mean dot data, Okay. So this dot is very common, Julia. That dot, this dot is called the broadcast operator. Okay, dot equals broadcast. Let's just see it on a slightly smaller example for a second. So let's create a, an array uh, one, two, three. Okay, and then do um, a function f of x is x squared. Is a function, and then apply f to on this array. So we have squared one, squared two, squared three. Okay, so it's a mapping, all right? So that's that's a dot. So if we can, if we apply mean to a dot of data, we didn't do anything because we're doing it for each element of data. Um, but if say we want to do a mean by the rows, then we can use the second argument to mean to mean which is dims uh, one. I'm oh, sorry, it's applied by columns in this case. Okay, so let's just move on and see a few more uh, data structures. Uh, and before we get into some uh, concrete statistics with Julia code, uh, so dictionaries. All right, Julia has dictionaries. Uh, if you come from uh, the world of Python, say, then you surely want to work with dictionaries. Basically, lookup tables with arbitrary keys. So this first line creates a, a dictionary packet here, where it's a dictionary from, it'll be a dictionary from anything to anything. Now, we could have had more concrete dictionaries. We could have had a dictionary from one specific type to a different specific type, and these dictionaries would be more performant. But in general, if you want to be as generic as possible and feel that it's like Python, then that's a dictionary from anything to anything. Dictionaries have keys and values. So now we'll set uh, as a key this thing, colon cats, that's for this key, and the value is going to be, in this case, an array of five normally distributed random variables with mean 2.3 and standard deviation one. Now, this thing in Julia is called a symbol. Okay, so a symbol. It's just a symbol, and the symbol is, it, it can re represent, it's just like a string, but it's actually more efficient. And, and it's, it's to, to, when you have functions based, so for example, parameters and different options on how to go, instead of working with strings, like this string dogs, working with a symbol is slightly more efficient, more convenient too. 
So this dictionary, if we want to see it now, it has its, its three keys are dogs, 25, and cats. And each one in this case has, just, just the way we did it, has an array of five normal values. So we can query the dictionary. The keys of the dictionary are this dogs, 25, and cats. A dictionary is not ordered according to its keys. And of course, we can retrieve uh, data cats, and this would be the entry associated with cats. And we can compute the mean of that. And just to be a bit more interesting, let's do it like that. There, this is the function piping. This is kind of applying the function mean onto what we see on its left. Okay, so that's the mean of the cats. We can do the same for the dogs, etc. Uh, but I'll skip this just because it's just so we have time for a bit more other things. All right. Another data type you have is tuples. Uh, tuples are like arrays, but they're uh, immutable. Uh, so in a sense, they're fixed, uh, and that makes them more performant and useful for small things. So let's create here in line number two. This is our uh, my simple normal. So Rn is just a function that creates a rand of a normal. Okay, standard normal random variable. And here data is going to be a tuple of three normals. So tuples use these round brackets as opposed to square brackets. Okay, so you'll see in the language use both of arrays, sometimes dictionaries, and a lot of tuples. Okay, the type of data is a tuple of float64, float64, and float64. Of course, we could have had a tuple of the form um, JuliaCon. 2021, and the type of this thing, so let's the type of this thing is a string in an int64, okay? And you can also have um, name tuples where you have event name the year. These are name tuples, okay? So a name tuple just allows you to do things uh, such as uh, that's my tuple, and then I can access my tuple. Dot. Okay. So this dot is very different from the dot we saw above for the broadcast operator. This dot means the event name, which is an element of this name tuple, which is like kind of a, a data type, okay, which has the event name of that. Okay, back to the tuple. We had data, the mean of data. There we go. You can do a mean of that. Uh, so you, the point is that you don't need a different mean function depending on what the argument of the function is. Okay. So as long as as long as this thing can behave like an abstract array, which I think this was a mean which was dispatched here. Uh, no, in this case, it dispatched a mean on 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 something that's iteratable, where you can go element by element. The mean can be computed. Uh, here is a second element of the tuple. Let's just see data again. Okay, here it is. And let's now try and change this to uh, 7.8. And we get an error, uh, which doesn't tell us in a very explicit manner, hey, buddy, uh, data is immutable, so you cannot change its element. OK? But tuples are immutable. So what you see is that there's not a set index. You cannot change the index, the second index of that to 7.8. OK. Next data type, structs. Structs. So a uh, structs are user-defined types. So Julia comes with a whole bunch of existing types, uh, you know, the numeric types and, and things of that sort. Um, and you can define user-defined types. Uh, and this is a struct. Um, so I mean, this existed since uh, at least at least as far as I know since the 1970s and C. This word struct, but that's kind of a struct is like a class, but it does not have methods, just data. It might have the only type of thing that it does is a constructor. So here, you know, the only type of function which it has. So this struct is a person, and a person has a weight, which is float 64. We want very precision, high precision weights, and a height. Okay? Um, so let's create a person. This calls a function person. So yeah, I can do question mark person, capital P, because of that, that's just a naming convention. Okay. Well, there's no 
some documentation of but it's a struct person and it's a subtype of any. So we won't get into that, but Julia has a type IO key. Okay, so we could have had that person as a subtype of, of something else. Okay, so this, this thing means that it's a subtype. So we're creating a person, okay, and then we can go to that someone and ask, ask their weight. Okay, either way. Uh, let's first do that. Let's just ask what their weight is. The weight is 102. Now, let's say we ate quite a lot and we try to change the weight to 103. Uh, this is in kilograms, not pounds. So, um, this is just a joke. So, it's we cannot, structs are immutable. Okay. We could have created a mutable struct by putting the mutable keyword here. Okay, that would have made it a mutable struct. Um, immutable objects can live on the stack and that allows them to uh, uh, be more efficient and you don't need multiple copies. Julia doesn't have to worry about the location. Mutable objects typically live on the heap and they're a bit slower. Uh, so things are immutable by default. Now, I don't think I can run this just like that because struct is already defined in the system. So the redefining types is often not as easy, but there is a package called revise.jl. So C revise.jl, which uh, in many cases makes this job easier, especially when you're developing something that has to do with structs um, and types. Okay, so... Um, Let's just do um, one more thing of, of showing the extendability of the language before we go to statistics, and I think that's, that's, that's nearing that. And we'll create a me, that's as in me, and you, uh, that's you, and we'll try to add me and you, so two people. And Julia says there's no plus between a person and a person. It does not know how to add people. Okay, fair enough. You don't want to be able to add everything. So what we can do here is we can actually take the plus function and overload it. So we'll import it from base, okay? Import is similar to using, but uh, you do that uh, for one of several reasons, one of which is when you actually want to uh, create more methods for the function plus, okay? And, oh, by the way, let's just look at methods of plus. Point. And there are 472 methods of plus. Okay, so 472 methods of plus. And what we're going to do is import plus from base, and we're going to define the a method for the plus function, which will probably be the 473rd one in this case. Okay, it'll be the 473rd, which adds a person X and a person Y. And it's going to do it just by returning, the return here is implicit, yeah, um, the person X, where you add the weights and you add the heights. Of course, syntactically, we could have made this nicer, so we would have just done this, because this is a one-line function, so we just do this. That's the same. It's maybe a bit less, uh, unless you're used to seeing this, you, it won't be clear to you, oh, this is a function. Okay, let's do this. How many methods in plus? 473. How many were there before? 472. Good. We got an additional one. We know which one it is. All right. And me plus you. There we go. All right, let's just do one more of these things because what I want to do is I, I want to do the mean of an array that has me and you. Okay, so the array me and you is, is a two element array. A vector is a synonym of array, of a one dimensional array, okay, of person, and it has two people. Okay, but if I try to do the mean of uh, me and you, um, Julia knows how to add me and you now because we did a plus, but mean also we need to divide by an in64. So Julia says, hey, I don't have a method divide of dividing a person by in64. I mean, guess why mean would want to do that? Well, mean would want to count the, just want to do the sum divided by the length, although there might be faster implementations sometimes in terms of memory and locality and stuff like that. But anyway, so if I do mean of me and you, that doesn't work. So let's extend also the division function where we divide a person by a number. Now, we could have said an integer, but let's here go to a real, okay? And uh, let me just uh, 
show you, this is an image from, um, I'll pull it down, Let's see if you can see this. This is, uh, this is from the Statistics with Julia book. So you've got the hierarchy of Julia numbers, so integers are reals and uh, assigned is an integer, etc. So you've got the whole type hierarchy. So we're going to stop here. We're going to divide by reals, okay? So you can divide by anything that's a real. And the way we're going to do this, the way this function is going to be implemented, again, we'll make it uh, notationally just uh, short term. The division of a X person by an N real creates a new person where the weight is divided by N and, and the height is divided by N. Okay. N is perhaps not the best uh, number for a real, so let's call it alpha. Um, it's very common in Julia code to include Unicode characters, so characters beyond the ASCII character set. So you'd often see code with things like that or like that. And what I'm doing every time is I'm using kind of LaTeX notation and then doing a uh, tab, okay? So this is alpha plus tab. Okay. So the 210 met methods for dividing uh, for the division. Uh, now if we do me, me and you, it works. Now, I don't know if you're impressed at this point or not. Most likely you're not. You said, big deal. You added two weights and two heights, and, and all this thing works. Uh, good. You're like, say, okay, you might be marginally impressed. You might go going like, huh, nice. But keep in mind that this type of thing where um, different types that mean did not know about, when the function mean was created, it never knew that there would be this thing called a person. Okay, of this specific form, uh, still the logic was created. Um, and now you can you can create the basic arithmetic for a person and then do mean of person. So this type of thing uh, propagates way beyond the simple example. So take for example the uh, great package differential equations .jl, okay, which implements state of the art differential equation solving methods. You can take types that differential equations never even thought about, use them in differential equations.jl, and differential equations will, the, well, Julia will compile the code to be high performing code for these types, and everything will work. So, this is the generality and composability of Julia, uh, really, and that's one of the reasons why it's kind of cool. All right, last thing here is data frame. So here's a data frame. We'll, we'll see a bit more data frame below, but we might actually have to skip that section in terms of time, although it's still in the notebook. So again, there was a tutorial in terms of JuliaCon. It was yesterday, but you'll find it on the web if you're looking on YouTube for dataframes.jl, okay? So a data frame is a much more uh, dynamic object. Uh, data structure than, well, a more versatile data structure than, say, a matrix, right? So this is a data frame where we uh, looked at the files uh, temperatures.csv. It's a comma-separated file with 770 rows. It has time series, in this case, year, month, day, and Brisbane is a city where I am, and Gold Coast is the nearby uh, municipality, and it looks at temperature differences over the days. Okay, so that's this DF. Okay. Um, and you can do a whole bunch of things with data frame. For example, I can do size on the DF and I can see what's in the data frame. Or I can do names of the DF and I can see the variables of the data frame. Or I can do DF dot say Brisbane and that would give me now the array of the temperature time series in Brisbane. Uh, in this case, let's do the mean of the Gold Coast and that's what we get. All right, uh, just so you see here, we, we, I won't dwell on this at all, but just a whole bunch of other descriptive statistics, a mean, harmonic mean, geometric mean, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These things live, a lot of them, in the stats base package. Summary stats, which does this, they live in stats base. So uh, you might see using stats base for, uh, although this command using was just run way above in the middle. Okay, I do want to just spend a, a second on uh, the minimum. Um, so look, the min function, 
minimum of five, two, and negative three, minimum of individual arguments, negative three, great. Uh, you, that's the min, sorry, the min function. You've got the minimum function, which takes a, a collection or an abstract array uh, and uh, does that. If I would do the minimum of five, the min, sorry, min of five to negative three, it doesn't work because there is no min of vector, okay? Min is defined as, a, as one of those methods that uh, accepts a variable number of arguments and it just find, it works argument by argument. This minimum got a single argument, okay? Now, you might know that you can now already do, you can use the ellipsis here, right? The splat operator passes the argument. So if I do min of five to negative three, it is exactly like doing minimum of five to negative three. Okay. So these two things are at least syntactically equivalent. And let's just use this to do just a bit of benchmarking. It's not a lot of what we'll do, but uh, let's just compare these two um, approaches for min and minimum. So here is um, data. Now we've got a million data points. Let's even put 10 million. Why not? And what you can do is you can use the time macro where you can uh, wrap code. So begin and end in general creates a, a code block, okay? I could have had multiple things in the code block, all right? And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do the minimum of this data, and that took uh, just about a hundredth of a second and didn't have any memory allocation really where I can do the min of data dot, dot, dot. And well, Julia is still compiling. Okay, so even though Julia is fast, sometimes you can still improve performance little by little. Uh, and in this case, calling this is also uh, more, much more appealing syntactically than calling this. Okay, so this took five seconds and there were a lot of allocations. So basically splatting of this data onto the, uh, pushing it onto the stack, probably from the heap to the stack is what took time to, to be arguments of this, of this min function but we won't deal more with benchmarking. There is a package called benchmarktools.jl, uh, which extends this basic uh, time macro, which comes with base. Okay, you can also get help on the macros, so that's a time macro. All right. We're up to the next section, and let's me pause and do and, and look at questions. So put this banner for question time. Let me look at the questions. Um, sorry. Let's go to the latest questions. Uh, so there's a question, is platting in general bad for performance? I believe so, yes. I believe that this splatting is generally bad for performance, but it's not. It, it, it depends what you're doing. Uh, there's such very. Um, so there's a question, and it says there is such great documentation out there in the manuals, introductory courses, discourse for all of these language questions. He had a nice summary of them. Oh, sorry, that's an answer. Um, Okay, so there's a there's a key question, and I'll and I'll answer that. And could you explain why heat map took that long? Is that the case with all plotting methods? Um, so yes, for the first time. So if I go now again to heat map and uh, and run this heat heat map um, for the first time currently, as of today, uh, with off the shelf Julia, it's going to be a bit faster. Okay, a bit, um, and by the third time it'll be faster and faster, and, and eventually it'll be uh, super fast. I think. Oh, I think data here changed, so that's maybe. Uh, this is not a great demo. What I'm showing now that heat map is stuck, but this is known as the first time to plot problem, and it has been off-putting some people uh, from using Julia as a full kind of. Uh, Quick interactive tool. I mean, when you when you you know you, you launch R, poop, you do something, you plot it, and in in a second you get your plot. And Julia, you need to wait. Um, yeah. The, well, the problem here with heat map is not that it's just stuck on on the fact this data is not data ahead. So let me 
let's create let's just let's just create here above this heat map sorry data equals uh rand uniform the one one thousand by one thousand so we've got a million data points if you put a semicolon you suppress the output button let's have this uh point noise data and let's see what happens but yeah first so so that that took a bit let's do it again now still there's a um this is a thousand by thousand image so some of the time is also processing with the front end and i'm running it again and so i think we're now down to uh things that have to do with with passing this data on to the to the, uh, the the jupiter but if i put like 100 by 100 then that's it there's no latency anymore but the first time to plot is first time to plot it's a, it's still a real issue uh, but a lot of people are working on that on pre-compiling uh, the packages for you so once the packages are going to be fully pre-compiled uh, things are going to be much faster um there's a question are jagged arrays supported in, in julia uh certainly because you can you can have an uh, you can have an, an array of, of anything first of all i mean first of all you can have an array of uh, my list is uh, one and two and here's my three okay so um this is this is a vector of any Okay, so this is uh, like if, you, if you're looking at Mathematica or anything like that, then this is a, just a nested list in that sense, and I can I can do. In this case, they're not just jagged; they also have different types. But even if they were on the same types, you can have like the the array we created before was a vector of vector of float sixty four. Um, Uh, there's a question, is the abstract of code lower an abstract syntax tree? And the answer is yes. So at code lower shows you, basically shows an abstract sy sy uh, syntax tree. Um, okay. Oh, okay. And uh, we hit the hide at the bottom of the screen after this one. Okay. All right. Let's move on and let's go to something uh, random. So we're getting into the second part of the <laughs> of the workshop, and we'll we'll now see a whole bunch of examples. Not so much about. Uh, we, we won't do line by line Julia programming, but we'll rather look at examples uh, that where each one has a bit of a story. Okay, so this we're in the section called something grand. Okay, so this first story is the Monty Hall problem, uh, and I'm I'm quite sure many of you, if, if if you haven't, if you don't know the Monty Hall problem, then look it up, Google, even plenty of videos on YouTube, etc. So it's a story where you have a game show and there are three doors and you come and you choose a door. And after you choose a door, the game show host reveals another door. And uh, then he asks you or she asks you, hey, do you want to switch or do you want to stay? And uh, you can do either. And some people will say it doesn't matter because it's all random, right? But it turns out that if you switch, yeah, after the game show host reveals the door. If you switch, you actually have a chance of, of finding the prize behind the door, which is uh, two thirds twice as much. Okay, and this baffles everybody. It's a it's a line of using Bayes rule. Um, it's it's in you'll find it in one of many places, uh, including the Stats with Julia book, but in many many other places. But of course, it's something we can program. So let's look at how we're we're programming this um, to, and by this we'll also look at sets. Okay. And we'll try to make this quick. So here's a function Monty Hall, okay? And the function Monty Hall has an argument switch policy. All right? So uh, the switch policy is, by the way, Booleans in Julia are, and as we do this, we'll see more things in the Julia language. So Booleans can be false or true, right? And this is a notation we use, false or true. So if we put false, it means not switching, true is switching, okay? That's the switch policy. 
this function does both things. So it simulates the situation and it does a few things, okay? And at the end, the return value returns true if you won the prize. Okay, that's what it does. So this is the logical expression. Okay, it returns this logical expression. All right, we could have deleted this return uh, statement. It's it's just coloring the fact that this is a return value. All right. All right. So how does it work? Well, we start by rand of, and you can put in rand. You can put uh, when you do rand of of a range, the type of this thing, or type of this is a is a unit range. Okay, and you can do a rand of a unit range, and it'll choose an entry. Of course, you know you can do rand of um, rand of one to uh, ten to the seventh. So it's rand of this unit range, and here's a number between uh, one and ten million. It didn't allocate an array with ten million entries. Okay, it just uh, keeps the unit range as a a lean structure. So here is a rand uh, where the prize is, and this is a random choice. So the prize and choice can be a one, two, three. So if the prize equals choice, okay. So the game show host looks at the uh, looks at your choice, okay, and says if you chose the prize, yeah. If you chose the prize, the game show host must open um, well can open one or two doors. So this is a door that the game show host is going to open. So what will open is the rand from the set difference. So Julia also has uh, sets, and you can do set differences. But in this case, you can also just take the collections. You'll do the set difference between 1 and 3 and your choice. Okay. So this is not going to be a huge set difference. But for example, if you do set difference of um, 3 and 2, it's just going to be the uh, the vector one and three, or one and three and one. It's going to be this vector, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. Whereas else is um, you 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 chose wrong. Game show host doesn't have a choice. Really. So in this case, you know. There's only one, the, the length of this thing is only going to be one. Okay, the length of the set difference. And that's what it's going to reveal. At this point, this function goes, if you're coming with a switch policy, which is switching, which is true, yes, yeah, so you can do it's true, then do this, else don't. Now, let me use this to show you a, a Julia programming idiom that uh, personally, it frustrated me at first, but I, 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 I think it's now part of life, and it's it's probably okay. Um, and it is instead of lines eleven through thirteen, it's creating line fifteen. So lines eleven through thirteen that I just commented out are equivalent to line fifteen where what happens here is basically the fact that this is a logical and, so the logical and has lazy evaluation. So if this thing is false, you would never have to evaluate this. Okay, so if you do false and hello, you never, well, the return value is this is, let me just put a semicolon so there'll be no output, nothing happens. Or if I do true, Oh, so I get the hello. Okay, so you'll see this if you're looking at other people Julia's code. Instead of this, you'll often see this, and yeah, why not? Okay, and that's your return value. So when we run this, we can now um, um, do Monty Hall with false uh, a million times, and uh, instead of doing the sum, well, we're now experts at mean. We might as well just do the mean. So this is a sum of booleans, okay? You can sum up booleans, and we can do the mean of multi hole here. And this agrees with the uh, 
theoretical calculation that you've got a one-third probability of winning if you don't switch and a two-thirds if you switch. Okay, keep this in mind next time you go to a game show. All right, remember we're in the unit called something grand, and this is what it is. So now let's speak about something else, um, common random numbers. Okay, so already from throughout the uh, this workshop, um, we've been using the fixed seed, right? Um, now, the reason we fix the seed, the reason we fix the seed is simply if you run this example at home, and as long as the implementation of the Marcin Twister random number generator didn't change, uh, you would get the same output, okay? Because uh, this is a pseudo random sequence was fixed here at some seed. Remember, this thing was just this thing was just uh, random dot seed exclamation mark zero. That's what this fixed seed did. This dot here means that seed belongs to the module random. So module random does not uh, put seed exclamation mark, the function seed exclamation mark in the in the namespace. Uh, uh, you have to do random. All right. Uh, but there are other reasons to fix seed, and let's see this uh, this example here and. Uh, Let's first run it and then speak about it. So say you have a uniform random variable between zero and uh, two times lambda one minus lambda. Okay, so it's parameterized by lambda. Okay, it's a uniform between zero and two times lambda one minus lambda. Its mean is the middle of this. Okay, so the middle of this range zero and two times this, which is just lambda times one minus lambda. And you know that lambda times one minus lambda behaves like uh, it's an inverse parabola. Okay, now let's say that you didn't know uh, that this is a mean, okay, this is a hypothetical example, and uh, you wanted to uh, estimate this mean curve as a function of lambda. Okay. So let's actually first look at the, at, the, at the output here, and I'll suppress some, some plots at first, okay? So this is the expected curve, and here is a plot of the expected curve, that's fine. And um, let's, here is a plot uh, of the expected curve together with um, what we do is we run over a grid of lambda and every time we just generate uh, not too many, just a hundred random samples. Of course, this is a hypothetical example, a hundred random samples. And for these hundred, so this is a grid of lambda. Okay, this is a lambda grid. Lambda, by the way, you can do backslash lambda. Okay. Lambda plus tab. Okay. And we generate 100 examples. And for each example, we compute the mean. All right, so you get this noisy estimate. Whereas the idea of common random numbers is to, so let's add this, uh, this additional plot here. The idea of common random numbers is that we actually fix the same seed for every lambda. So then we get this red curve which is still not the black, the correct curve, but it, it's much more smooth. So if you are, for example, looking for the optimal lambda, it would give you a uh, something with a much lower standard of variance, for example, okay? So you would use common random numbers on much more heavy computations, but this example shows it. So what's happening here? So we've got the theoretical mean, um, here, you haven't seen this yet. Oh, we did this before, right? We did this on the normal. So that's the mean on a uniform random variable. I mean, that's just going to give you this, this function, okay? The estimated mean uh, is you do a mean of rand of uniforms of n such uniforms, and get, that gives you the estimate. Okay? But you've got a second method for est. So if I do methods est, then I have two methods. One accepts a lambda, the other accepts a lambda and a seed. What the other one does, it just fix the seed, okay? And then I take this lambda grid and I apply the true mean on it. Well, sorry, the theoretical mean, the estimated mean, and this. This is a broadcast operator again, right? And then we get to some plotting. So this is plotting from the plots package, plots.jl, okay? Where in this form of plotting, what we've done is we've just put uh, the x coordinates and the y coordinates Okay, and then some options, labels, etc. Now the second function here is plot exclamation mark still follows the Julia convention where you'd put an exclamation mark if you are uh, modifying something. In this case, we're modifying the existing plot. Okay, 
So here we go, common random numbers. And uh, guess what else? This L here, this L is a macro. It comes from LaTeX strings. Uh, so you can do labels nicely. Okay, so there's a special type of macro syntax where you put this macro just prior to a string, and that's that's a macro. Okay, but we don't need to worry about the fact of the macro. As users, this is how we would format and create this lambda. All right. Now let's just go to a slightly more advanced version of this um, of this common 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 random numbers thing, and uh, say that now we actually want to estimate the mean of this slightly more complicated object. So this object here, this x is a random sum. Okay, so it's not a it's not uh, it's a random variable that's determined by a number of Simons, which is Poisson distributed, okay? Okay, this sum can be empty because n can be zero. And each element is uniformly distributed, okay? Where lambda is actually the parameter both for the uh, mean of the Poisson and is for the same, um, kind of similar to what we had before, okay? But not, not exactly the same. So this random variable x, you sometimes would call it a compound random variable. Uh, it appears, for example, in insurance where each of these zi's would be a claim. Uh, uniform is a bit silly for claim sizes, but let's say that's good enough for now. And you'd have a Poisson number of claims during a period. Okay, lambda is a parameter between 0 and 1. Well, it, you don't need to be a great probabilist to uh, use conditional expectation, et cetera, et cetera, and compute that this is actually the uh, expectation curve. So again, this is just a theoretical example. But say we don't know this, and we want to find the lambda which maximizes this expected curve, okay? Which is, again, going to be kind of a, uh, a parabola, okay? In this case, just make sure that we have a numerical example where this kind of works. So. What this example argues is something that actually some people, many people outside of simulation don't know. People that do a lot of discrete event simulation are aware of this, that by using multiple random numbers, you can actually, um, sorry, multiple random number sequences, you can actually get better estimates, reduce the variance. Okay, so let's let's first look at the, at the story and then uh, just look at a bit, a bit of code elements. So this is, this is just a minimal example for showing that. So here we have a plot of this expected curve uh, without common random numbers. So the same idea of common random numbers that we had before, we don't use it. And then we say, good, I mean, we've done the previous example. We know common random numbers, etc. cetera. So uh, we, plot, we plot it with common random numbers. The thing is that we still get something generated. But, um, and this has to do with a specific implementation of the Poisson random variable number generator that we have. But if we actually use different random number generators for the n's and different random number generators for the z's, then we actually get this uh, quote-unquote variance reduction, and we get this much smoother, or is it here, uh, this much smoother um, blue curve, okay? So there's two things that you want to understand here is one, why is this roughly happening? Was giving indication to why it's happening. Uh, but two, we, we want to get into the Julia code. So I'll focus much more on the two because why this is happening, well, um, you need to think about it a bit more, et cetera. And it has to do with the fact that the common random number phenomena uh, breaks when your each instance of X has a variable number of random draws because your N here is very Okay, now first of all, to demonstrate it here, we actually need to create our own Poisson on Poisson random number generator, our own Poisson RNG. So it's different than what we'd get with like um, systems Poisson RNG, which is actually a, a better RNG. Okay, so again, this is a contrived example to bring a point, but I think it's in a sense a minimal example that shows that you need multiple common random numbers. Uh, in certain cases. Okay, so this is this uses the system Poisson, and this is our Poisson random number generator. So it uses the quantile function, okay? Now you can use a quantile function on data, okay, with stats base. You can use, quant you can use a method of the quantile function of, let's, uh, let's, let's just create some data, 
and I'll put the 0 0.7 quantile. And so that, that gave me the 0 0.7 quantile of the data, but I can also do quantiles of say a normal distribution and uh, I want to do the uh, 0 0.975 quantile and that's a number we all know in statistics okay so and now again we've got multiple dispatch the quantile function exists in stat base but is also uh, has multiple methods to find for it in the distributions package and what you do here is you generate from a random uniform which gets this RNG entry. We'll get to that in a second. And um, it, 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 it generate it, that's the inverse probability transform. So a quantile uh, from a Poisson random variable, that's how you get the uh, Poisson random number. Well, Poisson random number. Okay, now here, this rand uh, gets an RNG, RNG random number generator. So <coughs> Julia has different random number generators. Uh, one of them is the Mersenne twister, okay? And um, that's uh, kind of the default one. So the Mersenne twister, you can create this object, which is an RNG, uh, which has a specific seed, All right? Uh, I mean, you can get congruential generators and others and others, but Mersenne twister is pretty good. Okay, at least good enough for us at this point. All right, now you can, this, this RNG, you give it to the rand function. Okay, so just so you see this with, with basic functionality. So if I do Mersenne twister of, of some seed, okay, maybe Mersenne twister is, is my RNG, and I can do now rand of my RNG. That's number. Let me create my, let me run my RNG again and do rand of my RNG, and I got the same thing. But of course, if I'll do two calls to uh, rand my RNG, then, uh, sorry. Um, so with two calls, let's use the show macro. You haven't seen the show macro before. It's just a nice little debug macro. Okay. The semicolon to suppress output. So you get for this seed, 2424, four, some arbitrary seed. You've, you've got again and again the same sequence of, of, uh, common, of numbers. All right, so we can pass this RNG into the Poisson random number generator. And then you've got two forms of the RV, the random variable, this guy. All right. You've got an RV that gets one RNG, and you've got an RV that gets two RNGs. The one that gets two RNGs will use one RNG for the Poisson and one RNG for the uniform. Okay, that's the idea. And then you do mean estimation, and you do one with one RNG, one with two RNG. And the rest is pretty much details here to obtain this plot. And that was a demonstration of two RNGs. Uh, just to finish this example, and then we'll get to just a bit of questions. <coughs> I can then wrap this. So say, of course, this is a very quick simulation, right? I mean, this is a simulation for a silly hypothetical example. But now think of simulations that would take uh, days to perform, even on a language like Julia. OK, so I can. Uh, I can wrap it in repeats where I would create a function argmax lambda, which takes lambda grid and finds the max, find max of the graph two. Okay, so the find max function, uh, find max will return a tuple with arg of a list, will return a tuple. Yeah, so find max of, say, this uh, array will say that the maximal value is eight and it is an index one. There's also a function argmax, by the way. All right, so this is now, imagine that we run this and we do this many, many times and we did it now a thousand times, okay? Where e each time there are a hundred repetitions, but we did it a thousand times. And what we can see that the standard deviation with no common random numbers is like that, okay, this thing. This is standard deviation with a single random number generate random number and it, of the argmax, but when you do the common random numbers, you actually <clears throat> got a much better estimate. So that's it for the advertisement for uh, common random numbers. I've put on the bottom of the video question time. 
So let's see. And then we'll take a quick break as well for uh, heading on to our third hour. Um, uh, so there was a question, why is there an apostrophe after the data in the call to heat map? So that apostrophe, um, so we'll just do this here, and data equals RAM5, okay, so RAM5, and let's do, uh, so basically, it's a transpose. Okay, if I do data dash, get a transpose. Now, what Julia did when it transposed, it actually changed the type. That type is an adjoint. Okay, but from practical purposes, this 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 dash is a transpose. Um, and the way we do the plotting of the heat map with that heat map, if I want to get the matrix oriented like it's like we think about it, uh, transposing and doing Y flip is uh, the thing to do. Uh, okay. I'm looking for another question to answer. Uh, is there anything? Uh, uh, okay, can you look at the top voted so there was a question are there any speed improvements if you specify the data type when you create a function uh, so in general the answer is yes um, so the more information that the Julia compiler knows about the types uh, the better for it now that doesn't mean that a completely generic function won't work and often a generic function like with this type t that we did is extremely performant and julia knows how to make it performant uh, if you go more into profiling code in julia you'll see the at code warn macro uh, which deals with which helps you profile issues such as different type of return argument this is when julia really suffers when the julia compiler does not know what's going to be the return argument type. If it's sometimes going to be a string and sometimes going to be a symbol or sometimes going to be an int and sometimes going to be a float, then Julia will still work, but it'll be uh, much less efficient. But frankly, from a user scripting perspective, you can always start to kind of program initially, at least that's the approach I've been taking, uh, even for kind of mild simulation software associated with my research. So, you know, I'd have some stochastic simulation model and I'd create software that's, that needs, well, that describes it. And then I, I'd start uh, programming in a type agnostic manner. And then after that, I'll add types. And maybe later after that, I'll add generic types. Um, OK, let's move on. So we'll take now, again, another uh, three minute break here in Brisbane, Australia. By the way, the Olympics here are apparently going to be here in 2032. I'm sure Julia Khan will be one of those massive events by 2032. So we just got news for the Olympics here. So I, I guess that's good. Anyway, so it's 2.05 a.m. here uh, and 2.08, meaning in three minutes, we'll uh, meet again. Uh, so that's an eight past an hour for most of the world. If you're in India or a few other places, then it's... Uh, 38 past the hour. Okay, see you after the break.
Okay, abrupt stop to the break music. Um, let's continue. So we're in the next section, and that is, do you still miss R? Uh, so just R call. Um, so here's a quick example of R call. Again, to get this working on your system, you need to uh, install R call uh, when R is on your system, and the R call installation will find the R installation. So using our call, okay. So what are we doing here? Um, we're reading um, from a file. Um, in this case, it's a file that doesn't have a header for the CSV. So we put header equals false for the CSV file. And we've write, read uh, data one, data two, data three. So um, summary stats, for example, on data one. You know, summary statistics of data one. Um, 20 observations with a mean of uh, just 53, etc. So this is an example of three machines that manufacture pipes, and uh, here's summary statistics of data two, and summary statistics uh, with 18 observations in this case, and a slightly different mean, and summary statistics of data three. So it's an industrial application, okay? And um, at the time that uh, this example was created, this was for the statistics with Julia book. Julia didn't have a great ANOVA package, analysis of variance, uh, and so R is a natural place to go. And that now Julia has a pretty good uh, ANOVA package. So you can find uh, an ANOVA package in Julia. Okay, I won't show it up today. But what we're going to do is we're going to take this data and uh, pass it on to R. Okay. The R instance. So basically, by the way, if I do escape L, I toggle line numbers. Okay. The lines um, uh, 13 through 16 are in the R language, okay? And this is the R macro in the Julia language uh, given to us by the uh, R call package, okay? And we also use a macro R put and R get to bring things between the worlds. By the way, integration with Python uh, using PyCall is much more kind of uh, connected. Okay, so so and uh, there are still quite a few things, including iJulia, that use PyCall quite a lot. So Julia integration with Python is kind of much more Python objects are exposed in Julia in a sense, where there is an R, we're putting stuff in the R world and giving it back. But let's see. So this Julia function is R ANOVA, analysis of variance, and uh, we have our H0 that uh, the means of data one, data two, data three, or of the associated uh, machines the mean uh, diameter length or whatever it is of the machines is the same, and H naught is that it's not. The mean is not the same for all three. There is, it, it, it exists a difference, okay? So what we're doing here in line number eight is we're actually just uh, changing the data to be in a, in a form that's um, um, uh, where we... When we do ANOVA with R, there's some integration you need to do with other language that just has to do with the form of the data structure that R wants the data. So it wants a data frame where you have a, uh, you have row for the, you have kind of, sorry, a column for the treat, for the response and a column for the treatment. And this is what this does. So uh, with this fill function, et cetera. Okay. And at this point we uh, create a data frame which is of that um, of that form, okay? Which has a diameter and then machine number, and these are the names of the data frame. This is one way of creating a data frame programmatically. Okay, you would have seen more of this in the data frames tutorial and elsewhere. Okay, so you take this data, which is in this case a uh, a matrix, and you 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 create a data frame from it. Now this R put actually puts it. Uh, in the R environment that's running, and then the R code uh, does the rest where it does ANOVA, analysis of variance, diameter as a function of machine number, mach no, okay, data equals data frame, and in this case we extract the F value, or the F statistic, and the P value, and we bring them back, and we see that with an F value of 10, the P value is uh, very low, so we uh, reject H0 meaning uh, there is evidence for difference between the machines, okay? So that's the one example uh, I'll show of using R. This appears in the Statistics with Julia book where we also implement ANOVA and Julia from first principles and kind of uh, 
a lot of the things in the statistics of the Julia book show that with different examples, you get the same number by trying things in different ways. So it's, in that sense, pedagogical. Okay, you get the same p-value. Okay. All right. If you are going to, uh, if you're in the R system, um, then this is an this is in CRAN, the R uh, Julia call package, and it works pretty good. Uh, I used it uh, recently and showed how you can uh, do a, a high performance, um, well, an epidemic simulation in Julia that would just completely get stuck in R, call it using Julia call uh, into R and then do the analysis in R, okay, if you're more comfortable doing the analysis in R. All right, the next section, some plots. Uh, so again, I'll, I'll put again one more, more time the link to uh, the many, 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 many resources. Uh, of course, I'm biased because this one is, is, is mine and my co-authors, uh, Hayden Clock. And the thing is, you just click on one of these uh, things and you get the code for it. I mean, that happens in many cases, but they, they're just standalone code snippets, which are the same code snippets that we also use in the uh, the book we created. So you, you can use that image gallery. At least that's a tool I use to see, oh, if I want to remember, oh, how do I do that? Or how do I do this? So here is some example, uh, a pseudo statistical example. I mean, certainly not an applied statistical one. Okay. Um, where we deal with uh, the sequence that one sees in the, in the Collatz conjecture. So the Collatz conjecture is a conjecture about this uh, sequence of numbers where, uh, where you have the following recursive rule, where if your number is divisible by two, meaning if even, then half it. Look at this thing, look at this thing. Let's just do this. So let's do uh, 10 div uh, three. So this is, integer uh, division without uh, remainder. So as opposed to 10 divided by three, Julia converts the types of, of division, uh, promotes them from um, fr promotes them from being a float, uh, sorry, an integer type to a float type. Even if you do 10 divided by two, you still get a float. You see, so the type of 10, an integer, the type of two is an integer, well, an in 64 in this case, but the type of, of this is a float. Whereas this um, does that. And to get it, you do backslash div plus tab. All right, so that's division by two, just to maintain the type. And here's an example of a function where we actually said, okay, you start with x, which is an integer, okay? Uh, integer is an alias for in 64, or in the case that you're running on a 32-bit machine, it'll actually be an in 32. Uh, notice uh, that there's no float, there's no type, like uh, there's no type float. Um, there's a type real, but that's something else. There's an where is an abstract type. A type can be in Julia, abstract or not. All right, so there's a float 64, a float 32, a float 16. No general float, but there is an int which is a synonym for n64. Anyway, back to this hailstone sequence. What you do is if it's odd, if odd, multiply by three and add one. And notice on Julia, you can take literals and just put them next to this x. You don't need this multiplication here, just a matter of notation. Okay. And you run this while as long as x is not equal to one. You run, you run, you run, as long as x is equal to one. And then you return n, which is the number of iterations you have. The hailstone conjecture is still unsolved, and, and frankly, most people don't have a clue. It's not like the Riemann hypothesis where people believe they're getting kind of closer and closer, perhaps. Hailstone, the Riemann hypothesis is more important. Yeah. But anyway, so the hailstone, so we think. So the hailstone conjecture is that this sequence will always hit uh, one, okay? So there's no infinite cycle up there high in the sky. What we're gonna do is we're gonna run hailstone hail length for initial values, where the initial values between two and 10 million okay to get this underscore uh, zero i just do a slash under bar zero tab a lot of characters to this. it looks nice okay so that's just another unicode character so that's the name of this variable by the way people have had variables using emojis and things like that 
Okay, so we're going to run this, and uh, this is going to be a the length, and then we're going to do a histogram of the length, and we'll specify how many bins we have in the histogram. So there we go, we have the histogram. I mean, this is not a, a typical histogram of, uh, of statistics. Okay, so here it is with 100 bins, here with 100 bins, etc. And this is a distribution of the length that's uh, associated with the first 10 million numbers. Okay. That was an example of plotting. Here is an example of plotting that's uh, much more of a data analysis, uh, a practical statistical plot, uh, where we're again taking this temperature data set and we're just creating these plots that are quite useful. Uh, so what you see in this example, which I think you haven't seen before, is the fact that you can take the result of plot, put it into a variable, Okay, so here I can look at the variable. Uh, let's let's do this above. I'll go above and go to the variable P1. Oh, well, it just shows me the plot. Okay, or the type of P1. Be a plot dot plot plots gr backend. Now backend. Let's get into this issue only mildly. So. The plots package uh, actually uses several backends. Uh, gr and Plotly, and PyPlot, and others. And you can use different backends, and it will mean that your plots look different, and sometimes, uh, well, they, they feel different. So for example, with Plotly, I won't do this now, but Plotly, you get somewhat interactive plots, etc. cetera. Uh, so just bring to your attention, you can look at this later, you could look in the plots package as backends, and read about plotting backends. So plot the plots JL package, unifies several other plotting packages. Um, there are other plotting packages as well that are kind of outside of this. But uh, anyway, so you've got backends. All right, just so we know about that. Uh, what else do we see here that's of interest? So there's use of dates. So if you're working with data that's certainly uh, temporal, then you want to use dates. So this comes from the package, uh, well, from the inbuilt package dates.jl. So to use these functions year and month and day and date, I'll have to use uh, dates.jl, uh, okay? And you can find that in the Julia documentation. So there's a lot of things to do with time conversions and stuff like that. Um, let's get to something a bit more specific. Let's just look at this first plot, okay? And let's, let's actually just, uh, just copy these two lines of code and just hello. this. First plot. So <laughs> what we're doing here is we're plotting dates uh, against uh, the time series, but we have here two time series. Now the default way in which you plot two series in a single call to the plot function is not by giving it an, an array, which would have been Brisbane comma gold codes, but by giving it a, a matrix, which is without a comma there. This is just a bit of a pitfall, so I just want to uh, bring your attention to that. So you see the, this is a matrix of float 64s. It's not an array of arrays. So if I, if I would have done this without thinking much or without seeing it before, my first guess would have been to put in uh, something like Brisbane comma Gold Coast. Okay, and then it would be be a vector of vectors that are each float 64. Okay, but no, this is a matrix and that's just an interface of plots. Okay, and then other things like plot attributes, like the color attributes, which you can, by the way, I think you can use, instead of C, you can use their aliases, you can say color, right? And, and these are all attributes you can find in the help for plots.jl. So things like the color attributes or label attributes, see how they, they're also uh, of this same form that you have here. So one per series. Okay. So let's just look at the type of this. Uh, so that is a matrix of strings. So again, it's not a vector of strings as you would have had if you would have done this. This is a vector of strings or an array of strings. So just be, be aware of this in terms of arguments. So that, that's uh, one pitfall. Um, many other small details, uh, but uh, to, to make these things uh, nice or marginally nice, and, but I, I hope you could uh, look at the examples for that. 
Um, n row is a data frames function. Okay. So data is a data frames, and n rows gives you the number of rows. So data here again, this is the data. Uh, you could do the size of the data. And give you just like the size of a matrix, the number of rows 777 and the number of columns is a number of variables names, or you can do n row. Okay, let us move on. So, um, here's a different example, a synthetic example. What we're doing here is uh, creating a mixture. Let's run it. So, we're creating a mixture distribution where uh, we're mixing two normals. Okay, so a mixture. Right, so you've got normals with this mean and this standard deviation. You've got normal with this mean, this standard deviation, and to be fancy, we use this, this thing. Right, write these things nicely. Okay, uh, so that's distribution one, distribution two, and notice also uh, on line number five, you can do assignment of you know you can always do like my var one and my var two equals two and uh, hello. Okay, so what I want to say is that um, it's, it's signing to the, well, you get here as an output a tuple, but then you you multiply, you 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 put two in my var one and hello in my var two. And we're doing, the, doing that's just a common programming paradigm in our books. And now, what's a mixture random variable? So if you're a C programmer, uh, you've seen this uh, in Python. This comes with other notation. You've seen it in JavaScript as well, uh, but not in all languages. So this is a trinary operator back in the world in C. So true uh, and yes. Otherwise, no. OK. So it evaluates, this whole expression evaluates to the first well, to the middle argument here, which happens to be yes, if this thing is true, yeah. For example, if two squared uh, equals four, equals equals four. But um, if uh, I do, uh, the, if I do two squared equals five, equals equals five, I get a no. Yeah. Um, so, with probability p, it's a random element from the first distribution, otherwise from the second distribution. That's how we created this one line. We created the mixed random variable. All right. So your data is 2,000 of these guys. Yeah, 2,000 of these guys. And now for the first time, we're using something from stats plots. Okay. Stats plots uh, Very nice package, which gives recipes for plotting on top of plots. Uh, this one doesn't have... Uh, uh, oh, it has documentation here, right? But anyway, that's stats plus JL. So go ahead and explore stats plus JL, and we're just going to use a few examples. This one is a density plot, and um, so this is this one. And you comment out this line. So this is a smooth histogram. Okay, it's kind of a no questions asked smooth histogram. You give it the data, and it plots the distribution of the data for you. Uh, Different uh, from the uh, histogram, the step histogram, which is just this histogram, when you can give that one the number of bins, right? You could put uh, 20 bins per quotient. Uh, you could have just had, instead of step hist, you could have had a histogram. Again, the exclamation mark here, each one of these has a version with an exclamation mark and without, which means plot on top of the existing plot or not. Okay, so, and that would be this rule, very serious thing. Okay, let's make it red and move on. All right, here we go. Now here, what we're doing, I won't spend too much time on this because time is running short, uh, but basically the same type of thing, but we're actually using uh, the package uh, kernel density.jl. So we're doing kernel density estimates, which stats plots did for you here. So kernel density estimation for every data point, it's actually taking a a kernel, say a Gaussian, and it's doing then a, a, a superposition of all of this and how you get it. And here in this plot, what we're playing with is the bandwidth parameter, okay, which that's plots kind of try to optimize for us here. The bandwidth parameter, you see that different bandwidths, you get different plots. So this uh, very narrow bandwidth, you get this thing, and this very wide bandwidth, you get that. All right. 
A different guy from this family still, uh, oh, no, let's start. I'll, I'll still pause here for a second. So we all start in line uh, number one. We define this function nixpdf. And this is something you haven't seen just yet. So it uses the PDF function, uh, which we get from distributions.jl. So PDF generally is going to get a distribution as a first argument, and then a so yeah, like a PDF of a Cauchy distribution, if you'd like, is a first argument, add the point 2.3, and it will give us the probability density function at that point for a Cauchy distribution. Okay. So when you're doing a mixture of this two Gaussians, all you need to put is dist one, dist two. Okay, and that's in, that's the underlying real PDF. That's this mixed PDF. That's this underlying PDF that you get a plot of here. Okay, let's just move on. And now a mixed CDF, just like a PDF, you have a CDF, a cumulative distribution function. By the way, mathematical distribution uh, distributions are kind of, uh, well, Julia's distribution package kind of feels like the mathematical one. And I think it's just that the designers just make great choices. So the distributions package dot jail is really nice. Uh, so an ECDF, empirical cumulative distribution function, is a step function based on the data, which uh, um, here you have the underlying real CDF of this mixture, it's going to look like this, and the empirical CDF uh, of the data gives you this object. Okay. The thing is that this empirical CDF object is actually a function, so I can then put, I can ask what's the empirical CDF at anything here at 344.2, and I'll see that it's 1, okay, because that's outside my support of the data. Or I can put it negative 344.2, and it's probably going to be 0. Maybe at around uh, 20, I'll get a different value. So that, well, it's going to be between 0 and 1 always, right? Now, um, here you see it applied via, again, the broadcast operator onto X group. This is like a plot of two empirical CDFs. And in probability and statistics, the glivenko cantelli lemma tells us that for ID samples, as we increase N, these empirical CDS will convert uniformly to the actual CDF. All right, what do we have here next? So uh, now we have something completely different, a QQ plot. That's, this, again, comes from statsplots.jl, a QQ plot. Mm, and now what happened now is a case of the back end breaking. And this is a bug, which I'm not sure if it has to do with the back end or if it has to do with Jupyter or the fact that I'm overloading a lot of things on this notebook. I have a feeling that if I run it again, it will fix itself. Um, I have no more comments about that. Such is life. So the um, QQ plot uh, takes quantiles of two distribution, well, of two data samples, of two data samples, and sees if their underlying shape is similar or not. Okay, that's the idea of a QQ plot. Uh, in this case, we're again generating synthetic data. Let's take data from beta distributions. A beta distribution, so let's do a, uh, a beta. So that's your beta distribution. Okay, it has these two parameters. Uh, in this case, we'll use the same value for the two parameters, B1 for the first beta and B2 for the second beta. Okay. And if the beta distributions have the same parameter, then look, these are their uh, kind of histograms, and you get pretty much the same data, well, the same shape, it's just random, different random samples. The QQ plot will fall on the line, whereas if you get a uh, change the shape, the synthetic case, and this hints, well, it doesn't hint, it shows you that, that one sample it has a very different shape than the other sample. Okay, that's the idea of a quantile uh, plot, QQ plot, yeah, this function. All right. Um, and finally, last but not least, or maybe least, our good old box plot uh, in statistics, where this is the same machine data we used ANOVA that we used for ANOVA um, with R. And um, there we do. I guess what we're doing here in this line, which is slightly different than what you've done before, is we're not, uh, so let's actually, let's go back to, let's jump to home. Uh, you can do this in Jupyter Notebooks. You can make these uh, links. Uh, and let's go to the R bit. 
And you see here we read the, and I'll just copy this down. We see it. Um, just reading the file, um, we've done it differently uh, in this example. So here you're reading um, three data frames, and each time you're taking from the data frame the, the data. Here. That's what's happening. Uh, and here you're doing, you're using the, uh, I think it's in base, the function read lines, which if you just do read lines on a file, then uh, it just returns you a vector of strings in that file. Okay. Um, but if I then use the parse function, so I can do the parse, say parse into float 64 of uh, 20, 200, of the string 243.32, and it'll give me that float 64. Okay. Uh, look, I do type of ANS, ANS is the last thing uh, evaluated, it's float 64. So if I want to now parse this thing into float 64, I'll do parse. 64 well, read lines, uh, but not really because I'm gonna I, functions in Julia are not vectoring by default. Then I'll put this dot, this broadcasting, and it, it'll know not to broadcast on the first input argument, but the second input argument is actually a vector, and I'll know to broadcast on that, and that's how I'll get the entries. There's still something here interesting, uh, well, many things are interesting, but the one thing that additional interesting for you is perhaps the fact that this float64, uh, this type, yeah, so this float64, which is a type, is in, can itself be an argument to a function. So the type of 64 is a data type, okay? So float64 this thing that I'm highlighting is of the type data type and its value is float64. Okay, so that's it. This is an outlier, by the way. All right, let me get some questions. Uh, we've got uh, question time, so I'll put this here and I'll go to the questions. I'm not sure I've been the best question manager in this workshop. Uh, excuse me if I haven't. Um, so let's see one sec. We've got a latest questions. Um, there is a question, won't the plot detect series automatically? Uh, I mean, do we need to specify everything manually? And uh, no, you certainly don't need to specify uh, everything manually. So um, plot, plot is, is strong. So look, you can you can do you can do uh, data equals rand one hundred plot data. All I want to specify here is legend equals false. Okay, and here you've got a hundred things. So you didn't need to. In this case, you didn't put the uh, horizontal axis. Of course, I could have put the horizontal axis. I could have put uh, one thousand and one to one thousand one hundred. That's not going to work. Let's put a comma. Okay, and it would do that. Now, you can plot a function. I can put, here's my function, f of x is cosine of x squared. Okay. In this case, and plot f. Uh, label, and now I don't do legend equals false, let's label as my function. So, so it knew to it knew that this is a function and it decided based on some heuristic where to sample it thinking where things are interesting or not. okay so uh, as far as it can it kind of does things uh, but these plotting examples we've shown here they're kind of optimized to be kind of uh, neat or at least as neat as we thought we should make them um, so that's why there's quite a lot of arguments in there um, again I, I i think that going through this you, you actually want to want to sometimes make things nice, so you want to look at examples, uh, either these or many others. Um, uh, there's a question, comment, hey, I didn't think about the fact it was 2 a.m. for the presenter. Wow, many thanks for being up. And uh, not from this is the best time at night. Kids are sleeping and uh, no emails from the university. I love it. Um, okay. 
Where can I read more about common random numbers? Um, so there are great books on simulation. Uh, um, the handbook, handbook, this book by uh, colleagues of mine at the University of Queensland, I really uh, recommend it, Handbook of Monte Carlo Methods. Uh, Dirk Cruz, uh, Thomas Tamer, Josh Votev, uh, but also much more lightly in the, if you just go to the uh, chapter 10 of the Statistics with Julia book, at least the, the idea there is, and is you, you get the, you get some input insight about common random numbers via, by example. Um, okay, just one more question. I think, um, Okay, so there's a question, and the question is, why does parse of float64 read lines? Let's go back to our here. Why does parse of float64 read lines of file work, but float64 read lines of file uh, doesn't? So the float64, okay, so this is, let's, let's try to unpack this question. Let's hope I can answer it. Let's see. So the question was, and that's one of the things you'll be running into when playing around. Okay, so so you 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 look. You can do float sixty four of of pi. Okay. Uh, I, I mean, I'll use it just to show. You. Here, here's pi. You know pi. I know pi. Pi. All right. This pi is like can be the symbol pi. I'm not sure about the exact implementation, but can be of different types. Okay. I, I guess you can do an an int. And no, you can okay. Let's leave that. But you can do float sixty four of pi, but you cannot you cannot do float sixty four. This is a, by the way, this is a constructor, right? This is a constructor of a type. You cannot do float sixty four of the string three point one four because there's just no method matching float sixty four to string. And the uh, idea of the designers of Julia was, hey, float sixty four is such a basic thing. We're not going to do string parsing as part of its constructor. Okay, it's not JavaScript. Okay, so then you do parse float, six, float 64 of um, that's pretty, I hope that answered it. Uh, so when you do float 64 on the read lines of the file, that won't work. I mean, you can do, again, you can do float 64. You cannot do float 64 on pi and on math constants e, okay? That won't work, okay? But you can do float 64 dot on pi and math constants e. I mean, you know what math constants e is, all right? Or I think there's also math constants dot gamma, my favorite, or there's constant. Okay, so you can do that. Um, you, so you can apply the broad in broad that won't work right but that will you can apply the constructor broadcasting but not on a, an array of strings for this course hope that helped all right let's close the question time and we've got 19 minutes so we we'll, let's see some exciting things um we love data frames yes we do but we're not going to do them in these 19 minutes so uh, you can go through these examples, uh, uh, go through one of many of Bogomil's uh, tutorials, dataframes.jl, specifically the one yesterday, but also others that exist, uh, and basically deal with, with data frames. Uh, missing values, uh, et cetera. Um, one, one nice function, okay, I cannot, I cannot resist the temptation, but one nice function which, which is good is, so here's a data frame where you've got reading a file where you have a name and a date and a grade and a price, uh, one nice function is this describe, which creates another data frame where each row is kind of a different variable and you've got like summaries of the variables. Oh, but since data frames appear, let's also, let's use it as an opportunity to also see a different type, slightly more complex type or more complicated type that will appear and you'll see. And that is a union type. Okay, so let's, let's actually spend a second on that. So uh, we'll do function my function, okay, which works on X, uh, which is a float 64. And all it does is it does show of X squared. 
uh, my function of uh, of uh, two point three, which says x squared is that okay? This is by the way mostly a debug macro. Okay, this show, but it's it, it for scripting it works well. All right, that's that's my function two point three. Uh, so of course, if I do my function two, so without a dot, uh, oh, no method matching my function of n64. So I could have defined the function to be of the union of a float 64 and n64. This is not the best example, but at least it kind of uh, shows a point, uh, at which point the x can be either a float 64 or an n64. Now, in the world of data set frames, this uh, cons so so it's a type that's either this or that. Okay, in the world of data frames, this is useful because you have the type missing. Okay, you have the type missing because often you have missing data. So what you'd have in the data frame is when we look at this data here, see the data when we just loaded, uh, the fourth line, the grade was missing for Khadija, uh, no grade. All right, it's missing. Uh, that missing is of type missing. Uh, that's it. I think that's all the time budget we have for uh, data frames. Let's move to some basic info. All right. Um, this example is a not an applied example. It's a, it's a, here it is. It's a, it's, it's a contrived example. Uh, for doing a bit of simulation to compare maximum likelihood estimation on a very simple case, uniform between negative two and some unknown higher value, and method of moments estimation. So it's comparing two points estimates, and it's uh, looking at uh, the mean square error of the estimates and the bias and the variance, and the mean square error of a point estimate is the variance plus a bias squared, and it's it's comparing performance. Okay, that's the type of thing. This is again this bug that appears here, which is, when I run this again, I'll fix itself. I'm not sure why. Again, uh, let's blame Jupiter. Um, okay. So um, in terms of uh, yeah, I don't want to spend too much time on this example, but if you spend time looking at it in terms of the pr programming uh, aspects, uh, what this is doing is one of those things where you're going to try different things and, and you're keeping your results in a dictionary. Okay, so I just want to discuss lines 16 and 17 because it's well, it's one line, this line of code, because it's, it's, it's a bit complicated. So the idea here is that we're doing multiple experiments, and this might be not just in a theoretical setting like we're doing here. It may be in a setting where you're doing multiple experiments and want to keep results. And you want to keep your results in a dictionary. Now, before I showed you uh, about a, an hour and a half ago, we had a dict like that, which was a dictionary from any to any. But I can do a dictionary from a string of an int, for example. Okay, so it's just a dictionary where I define that the key type is a string and the value type is an int, etc., etc. So in this case, we want a dictionary from a symbol because we like working with symbols as opposed to strings to an array float 64. Okay, where that would be the result. Now, when I initialize a dictionary, look, if I do this dictionary from string to an int, I can initialize a uh, uh, and uh, give 32 and uh, Leah and give uh, 54 and Moshe give uh, 70. Okay. So I can do this. And um, that was the initialization, and it was actually with this type of thing, which is called in Julia a pair. It's basically a, 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 a nice way to present a tuple. And you'll see this appearing in, in different contexts. Okay, so it's a pair from a string to n64. So that was an initialization. So that's that's this type of thing. Um, now, what we um, what we have here is uh, oh, it's an anonymous function. Okay, and that's something that we haven't seen yet. So let's let's see it in a, a slightly simpler context. Uh, let's say that or so what I want to show you is, is the anonymous function or the lambda function. So I want to say uh, uh, 
my, I'll just do function my map, uh, F and A, okay? And this function uh, wraps the input function F to elements of A. Um, let's do that. Okay. Oh, okay, let's forget this. Excuse me, like this. All right. And what this function does is it just does f uh, dot a. Okay. Let's see. Let's see. So if I do uh, if I do my map square root on one two three. Uh, yeah, a map square root on one two three. But of course, I didn't do anything. I just did the broadcast operator. I did nothing else. However. What if instead of square root, I would like a function that does cosine of square root? Okay, so um, I can do this thing. I can do. I can make a function before, which will be uh, my g x equals cosine of square root x. Oh, by the way, I can also do uh, this. this is it has this thing and it's kind of messy. And I can do my G. Uh, however, this my G just lives in the namespace once and we never use it again. So let's do an anonymous function. This exists in JavaScript, in Mathematica, in Python. It's uh, Lambda functions in other places as well. So in functional programming languages, etc. And then we'll do this. So there you go. This is your anonymous function. That's it. So this whole story was here for the anonymous function. Um, now, in terms of the, uh, the construct here, what we're doing is we're creating, we're mapping the anonymous function, which I just highlighted. This is this thing on the left. And this anonymous function takes a symbol and gives you the pair, and the order of precedence happens to work here, the pair of the symbol going to an array of float under an n. This is how you initialize arrays. By the way, initializing arrays in Julia. One way you can do it, uh, you can do ones of float 64, uh, a million. Uh, here you've got a very big array. Great. You can do zeros. You can do without the float 64, and I think the default would be float 64. But if, so of course, if you wanted to uh, you know, float 16, it's because you uh, then you can. Um, and it really takes more time. All right. Uh, but you can also do an array of, uh, sorry, it's like this. It's an array of float 16, uh, open round bracket, and then you put say undefined because you don't even want to put anything there so you just want to allocate the memory but you don't even want to run over the memory and put the zeros uh, and undefs and put a million and you've got now this is junk that was in memory and then you could fill it up okay so that's the type of thing we're seeing here. all right so it's mapping this thing onto our symbols and that's initializing our dictionary all right that's it this was just an initialization of the dictionary. Initialization is sometimes a bit more painful than other things. So here it is. Here it is initialization. Uh, I don't think it depends on anything else. Yeah, there it is. Okay. So we've got now, that's our dictionary where we're going to store results. Okay. Let's move to the next example. Um, and this one is, uh, this one does maximum likelihood estimation. Again, a theoretical example, but it actually needs to solve this nonlinear equation. So when you do maximum likelihood estimation for the gamma distribution, you need to solve this nonlinear equation. And we use here the find zero from the roots package. Okay. So that's kind of cool. Uh, so you get the distribution of the estimator, but this is again, not practical statistics. Then we get to these examples, so I'm just highlighting them so you can, we're finished in about eight minutes, so I'm highlighting them so you can look over yourself. So here are, here are good old confidence intervals. You're comparing now machine one and machine two, and you want to do a confidence intervals. So you can use, for example, the equal variance t-test, so the assumption that the variance is equal on both samples, and then pool sample variance will be used on data one, data two, and then you apply the conf inf, int method. So get, you get a... This gives you a 95% confidence interval. 
right? If you change the confidence level, uh, if you make it uh, now uh, smaller, the confidence interval should become um, bigger, okay, and vice versa. All right, so this comes from hypothesistests.jl. Uh, here is the same code, just uh, manually done, just to kind of see we got the right thing. Um, a satellite unequal variance t test. Uh, so you get output kind of similar to R. So the test result is this object of comparing data one and data two with delta zero. Um, your H zero, your null hypothesis is a data one equals data two. And here you don't assume equal variance. So you use a satellite approximation. So you get this uh, number of degrees of freedom is, uh, is you know, this non-integer, which comes from this approximation. Uh, and when you run such a thing and get a test result, you can query it with a function like p-value and get a p-value of the test. So you get this in the output, but you can also query it. Uh, where do we see? Let's see this this p-value of the test result. The p-value is here. So this number is this pretty printed number, same one. Uh, let's do methods on p-value. So about 35 methods in p-value now. Keep in mind that I've loaded package GLM and stuff like that. Okay, I know I'm speaking quick because time is short. Uh, linear models, uh, just so you know that this is here. So if you look at this first thing, uh, first example, all, all we're doing is looking at the silly five data points and we're gonna fit a line through these five data points. Um, and this cell, which I won't have time to discuss, just shows you how to do it in a variety of ways. And it's more of a gateway to linear algebra if this is what you want to see. So you solve the normal equations using the backslash operator the famous backslash operator from uh, MATLAB is in Julia, okay? Uh, I mean, MATLAB didn't do all of the numerics. Uh, they just uh, plagiarized, I think, from uh, LAPAC, but uh, but the backslash operator was, was a nice thing, uh, which I think is MATLAB invented and it's useful. So this is this is solution of the normal equations. This is using the more pseudo pseudoinverse. This is using uh, QR factorization. This is using singular value decomposition. Okay, so these, these functions exposed to us through linear algebra, which is coming, comes with Julia, uh, give you a QR decomposition or an SVD object. And then on those, you can get the V or the U matrix or the singular values. This constructs a diagonal matrix. So a diagonal, in general, oh, let, let, let's see this a second. So here is the identity matrix in Julia. Uh, it's this thing that took a few bytes of memory. Uh, you don't have this. There's no I100. Uh, this is your MATLAB identity matrix. Okay. Uh, I mean, you can create a function like this. Let's do I n, and we'll just say uh, I equals equals J. And uh, one, otherwise zero for i in one to n, uh, a in one to n. I think that would work. Let's see if we do uh, i five. Let's say entity five. But the Julia identity is like this, and it actually it works well. So if you take like a random three by three matrix, or an arbitrary three by three matrix, and they add to it the uniform scaling the identity, this works. By the way, important, in Julia, you cannot take a three by three matrix and add to it the scalar 17. No plus between a matrix and an int. You need a dot plus, um, different than uh, MATLAB, for example. Um, you've got on the documentation, let's find it, uh, differences between Julia and other languages. This one. So uh, perhaps if you've never looked at the Julia docs, maybe this is the place to start. Noteworthy differences from other languages. Of course, this is more at the level here. You start indexing by zero. Here you start by one. Here you do this. Here you do what one. But noteworthy differences from R, from Python, etc., 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 etc. Okay. So. We're now going to get here to um, the um, 
linear models, generalized linear models, and basic machine learning. Um, if you look at the, at the, I think it's going to be here. So you can you can go to the NB viewer version of this thing and, and look at, at how all of the output would have looked, uh, finishing with with a bit of deep learning and clustering and uh, a bit of digit classification, etc. Uh, but obviously one can't fit everything in one tutorial. If this was your first entry point uh, to Julia, then I'm uh, really humbled and honored that I, uh, you got, I got to do it with you. Uh, if not, I hope you learned something. Um, and let me just use the last minute or two to answer questions. So I'll go to let's see if there's some top voted questions. Don't see anything significant. Let's go to the latest. Um, there was a question how to specify the bandwidth. So in kernel density, um, um, KDE bandwidth equals H. Oh yeah, okay. So you can have named arguments in Julia functions, uh, the definition of the function after the semicolon. Okay, so the KDE function has wants data and then wants named arguments, which can come in any order. Uh, so bandwidth equals H. And any more? Any great question we can finish up with. One the plot, ta ta, ta ta. Um, no. So I think we'll finish here. Thank you very much. I'll put this uh, this this uh, closing uh, music. I, I just like the countdown music. So I wish everybody a great JuliaCon. So thank you. Bye-bye.